rejected. The committee will come to order. Uh, the committee meets today to hold a hearing on restoring the public trust to review of the Federal Pension Forfeiture Act. But prior to the hearing, the committee is going to hold a very brief business meeting to consider a resolution in several post office designations. H.R. 4054, introduced by Congressman John Sullivan of Oklahoma, designates the U.S. Postal Facility located at 6110 East 51st Place uh, in Tulsa as the Dewey F. Bartlett Post Office. This bill would honor the achievements of former Oklahoma Senator and Governor Dewey Bartlett uh, during his time in Congress. H.R. 4346, introduced by Congressman Steve Booyer of Indiana, designates the postal facility located at 122 South Bill Street in Francisville, Indiana, as the Malcolm Melville Mac Lawrence Post Office. Mac Lawrence was a war hero, community leader, and a teacher. He was awarded the Silver Star for Valor, two Purple Hearts, and two Bronze Stars during World War II. After returning from war, Mac began a 30-year career in teaching at Francisville High School, where he touched many young lives. H.R. 4456, introduced by Congressman Marion Berry of Arkansas, designates the facility of the United States Postal Service, located at 2404 Race Street in Jonesboro, Arkansas, as the Hattie Caraway Station. This bill would recognize Hattie Caraway as the first woman to be elected to the United States Senate, which took place on January 12, 1932. I have a technical amendment to this bill, which I'll ask the committee to adopt at the appropriate time. H.R. 4509, introduced by Congressman Neil Abercrombie of Hawaii, designates the facility of the U.S. Postal Service at 1271 King Street in Honolulu, Oahu, Hawaii, as the Hiram L. Fong Post Office Building. This bill pays homage to the accomplishments of uh, former Senator Hiram Fogg, whose time in the Senate spanned three terms and who served under five presidents. H.R.S. 629, introduced by Congressman Tom Price of Georgia, supports the goals and ideals of a day of hearts, congenital heart defect day. This resolution shows support for the increased awareness and, and research about the more than 35,000 infants <clears throat> that are born with heart defects each year in the United States. S. 1989, introduced by Senator Jack Reed of Rhode Island, designates the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 57 Rolf Square in Cranston, Rhode Island, as the Holly A. Charette Post Office. Lance Corporal Holly Charette of Cranston, Rhode Island, and of the United States Marine Corps, was 21 years of age when she was killed in a suicide attack in her vehicle in Fallujah, Iraq. June 23rd, 2005. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, uh, we've had a chance to look over all of these proposals. Uh, these are meritorious uh, postal namings and resolutions, and uh, we want to join with you in urging our colleagues to support them. Uh, thank you. I'm going to hold the record open until the end of the day for any members who'd like to submit a written statement. Um, an amendment to H.R. 4456, making corrections to the bill, has been distributed. I ask unanimous consent the committee adopt the amendment to H.R. 4456 without objection so ordered. I now ask unanimous consent the committee favorably report the following bills and resolutions to the House. H.R. 4054, H.R. 4346, H.R. 4456 as amended, H.R. 4509, H.R. 629, and S. 1989. Without objection so ordered, the committee stands adjourned and will reconvene in, in just a couple minutes for the hearing on a review of the Federal uh, Pension Forfeiture Act. I don't have it. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about it. Uh, committee will come to order. Uh, we meet today to discuss legislation in intended to restore public trust in the uh, federal government. The Federal Pension Forfeiture Act provides an important deterrent by denying federal retirement benefits 
to federal policymakers convicted of accepting bribes, defrauding the federal government, embezzling federal funds, or falsifying federal documents. The public is rightly concerned about how government officials interact with people who get paid to influence decisions. This isn't anything new. Throughout the nation's history, we've regularly experienced cycles of scandal and reform. The American people don't care about partisanship and pointing fingers. They want to know that their government's working honestly and openly. The Federal Pension Reform Act, uh, excuse me, the Federal Pension Forfeiture Act will add more teeth to the penalties for mixing personal gain with federal policy. A federal pension is a sweet deal. One reason it is uh, sweet is to make federal employees less susceptible to pressure from outside groups. Under this bill, if you commit a felony that undermines the public trust, you forfeit your federal pension. American taxpayers shouldn't be forced to support a person that has violated the public trust. It's a harsh penalty, but so is the damage done by even one case of undue influence. Over the last few years, and particularly this Congress, several members have offered similar bills. This Congress, several bills have been introduced that share the same basic principle. Commit a felony related to your official duties, you lose the biggest perk. Many of us held town hall meetings over the past few weeks in our districts. People are angry, disillusioned. The bad acts of a few have tainted the all of us who serve in public office. It's time to begin restoring the public's faith in government. We welcome three distinguished witnesses who have excellent credentials in working to promote and create trustworthy government. First, we'll hear from Linda Springer, Director of the Office of Personnel Management. Then we'll hear from Shelley Pingree, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer of Common Cause, and Joan Claybrook, President of Public Citizen. We want to thank everybody for joining us and look forward to their insights on this uh, proposal. I'm going to now recognize a distinguished ranking member, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased that you're holding this hearing. Uh, the indictments and scandals now gripping Washington have shown that our laws and regulations are not working uh, to promote honesty and integrity in government. Nine years ago, as this committee was launching its ill-fated campaign finance investigation, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that called for a comprehensive approach to curbing the influence of money and special interests in Washington. I wrote that, quote, the real scandal is what's legal and common, end quote. And I said that our goal should be to understand how the process functions at every step, to expose its flaws and to get rid of the loopholes. This approach may not be popular in Congress, but leaders of both parties must realize that the situation must change. I still believe, believe this today, and I, and I feel confident that under Chairman Davis's leadership, the committee can begin to fulfill its fundamental responsibility to ensure our nation has honest leadership and open government. In the years since I wrote the op-ed, Americans have witnessed a rising stream of abuses in Congress and across the federal government. There have been allegations of bribes on the House floor, criminal indictments of high-ranking officials, including a congressman and the vice president's most trusted advisor, rigged federal contracts, K Street shakedowns, and a burgeoning corruption scandal. Our committee has an essential role to play in restoring public confidence in government. We are the committee with the authority to reform the ethics laws that govern the federal government. We are the committee with the authority to restore the principles of open government. And we are the committee with authority to close the revolving door between federal agencies and the private sector, to ban secret meetings between government officials and lobbyists, and to halt procurement abuses. Uh, to meet these challenges, we must do two things. First, we must use our broad investigative power to investigate abuses and ensure accountability. And second, we must take a comprehensive approach to reform. The legislation we're discussing today, denying pensions to political appointees convicted of felonies, may win broad support, but it won't do much to clean up Washington. In fact, most political appointees don't even serve long enough for their pensions to vest. We need an approach that stops political appointees from giving lobbyists and special interests secret access to the halls of government, that halts or at least slows down the revolving door that spins between the White House and K Street, and that ensures the government's business is conducted in the sunshine. We need to restore honesty in federal contracting, to stop cronyism, and to rebuild the integrity of our science-based agencies. And we must encourage whistleblowers to come forward and ban the insidious use of covert propaganda. This is a large agenda, but it's uh, absolutely vital. Corrupt practices have taken a deep hold in Washington, and it will take comprehensive reforms to restore honesty and accountability. The, um, 
The chairman and I met earlier this week to discuss these issues. We did not agree on every detail, but we did agree that on two fundamental points, reform should be comprehensive and far-reaching, and now is the time to act. And we pledged to work together to see if a drew, true bipartisanship can be achieved. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for again holding this hearing, and I look forward to working with you on these matters. Um, thank you, Mr. Waxman. Let me say we did agree there needs to be a comprehensive approach, and it's just a small piece, and hopefully we can. Unfortunately, we may not have jurisdiction over everything we'd like to do, but we have a lot of jurisdiction, and uh, let's try to use it. We have a window of opportunity, and hopefully uh, uh, we can work together on these issues. Uh, any other members wish to make statements? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, one, thank you for holding these hearings. Uh, thank you for working with Mr. Waxman during the past year and a half. Um, it's been very important that we work together to deal with this issue, and admittedly, it seems like a small part of what is truly a very big problem. Uh, but after having 20 community meetings in my district, uh, this, this issue right here is a no-brainer. And after having 20 community meetings in my district, uh, the biggest message I got was that they want us to act uh, as we should as an independent branch of government and, and not as a parliament um, that, uh, that somehow is uh, closely tied with this administration. The administration has its sole and complete responsibilities. We have our sole and complete responsibilities. And I am uh, grateful we're dealing with this issue, and I hope that we'll be dealing with a number of other issues in the weeks and months to come. Thank you. Mr. Souter. Thank you. We're at a, another critical crossroads in America. And uh, based on what we've seen in some of our fellow members in Congress, including some in our own party's leadership, we need to uh, really, uh, ca we cannot ignore the present crisis. We need to move ahead. Uh, quite frankly, we should have moved last fall. Some of those proposals were blocked inside of our own leadership, including one applying to congressional pensions by Congressman Shattig. But I'm glad to see that we're starting right out this year in our first hearing with this proposal. Mr. Chairman, I applaud your efforts to bring some changes to government in our first week back. As everyone knows, we have lately been faced with corruption, malfeasance, and abuse of the public trust. It's high time that public officials are held accountable for their actions. We cannot allow individuals to line their pockets by taking advantage of their position in government. I believe the Federal Pension Forfeiture Act sends a message to any would-be lawmaker that your punishment will be more than a jail sentence. It will impact the rest of your life. We must root out corruption wherever it may be found. I strongly support Chairman Davis's bill. The bill, as has been drafted, covers only members of Congress, congressional staff, and political appointees in the executive branch. As we move forward, I believe this bill should be expanded to cover all federal employees. The most important part is for the elected officials and our appointees to be held accountable, and I understand that. And I realize that the high-profile nature of recent scandals make legislation dealing specifically with those scandals a very immediate priority. But I also believe that we need to take this opportunity to make complete reform of government as well as send a message to all federal employees that corruption will not be tolerated at any level of government. In the late 1990s, a theft ring involving collaboration between outside contractors and the Department of Education employees operated for at least three years, stealing more than $300,000 worth of electronic equipment, computers, televisions, VCRs, et cetera, and collecting more than $700,000 in false overtime pay. The scheme involved a Department of Education employee charged with overseeing an outside contract. The employee ordered equipment through the contract paid for by the Education Department and had it delivered by a complicit contract employee to her house or the homes of friends and relatives. The complicit contract employees also did personal errands for her, such as driving to Baltimore to bring cab crab cakes for her to eat lunch in Washington. In return, she signed off on false weekend and holiday hours that they never worked, paid for by the Department of Education. Eleven individuals, including four Education Department employees, have been charged in a 19-count indictment. Another theft ring was exposed in 2000, which $1.9 million in federal impact aid funds intended for two school districts in South Dakota were fraudulently wired to several bank accounts in Maryland. The banks, <clears throat> the funds were used to buy $135,000 worth of real estate, a $50,000 Lincoln Navigator, and a $47,000 Cadillac Escalade. This theft was only uncovered when a car salesman alerted the FBI after thieves tried to use false credit information to purchase a Corvette. These instances show 
that non-elected and the, and the supposedly non-political employees also abuse the public trust. As much as we should be concerned about members, staff, and political appointees abusing the public trust, we should also punish rank-and-file bureaucrats who line their pockets with taxpayer money. They are also abusing the public trust, albeit not in the high-profile manner that gets splashed across the news. That said, I applaud the chairman for his leadership and fast action on this legislation. First, we must clean our own house. We must clean our own party, and we need to be aggressive in this, uh, or the public will do it for us. They are angry. They are justifiably angry, and this important piece of legislation must be moved immediately. Thank you very much, Mr. Souter. Members will have seven days to submit opening statements. We're now going to hear from our first uh, witness. Um, the Honorable Linda Springer, the Director of the Office of Personnel Management. Linda, thank you for being here today. You know it's our policy. We swear you in before you testify. So if you'd rise and raise your right hand. You saw him testify. The testimony you're about to give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Go ahead and proceed. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the Federal Pension Forfeiture Act. The bill would expand the list of offenses in current law that trigger a loss of federal retirement rights. It would add to the current list of violations a wide range of offenses from accepting a bribe to making false statements on a federal benefit application. The expanded list would apply to violations committed while in office, if punishable by imprisonment for more than one year, by a member of Congress, a congressional employee, or a presidential appointee. As drafted, it would apply to a number of clerical and administrative employees at very modest salary level, as well as to individuals occupying positions at the highest levels of government. The administration is supportive of the concepts outlined in this draft bill and looks forward to working with Congress on the details of the legislation. With one exception, under both current law and the bill's expanded list of offenses, survivor annuities for the widow or widower and children of an offender are barred. Payment of spousal benefits is permitted only in forfeiture cases when the Attorney General determines that the spouse cooperated with federal authorities in the conduct of a criminal investigation and subsequent prosecution of the individual which resulted in such forfeiture. This exception would be applicable to the offenses that would be added under this act. The Office of Personnel Management wholeheartedly endorses merit principles with a strong emphasis on honesty and integrity in government service. We'd like to take this opportunity to briefly discuss the history of the forfeiture provisions. The Hiss Act, approved in 1954, contained a list of job-related federal felonies, the conviction of which would bar retirement benefits for, that would be payable to federal employees and their families. Most of the convictions under which annuities were denied were for, for violations of postal law and other felony convictions that did not involve national security. Controversy over the Hiss Act arose in cases where the courts had imposed minimal penalties, such as suspended sentence, small fines, or probation, yet the offenders and their families suffered the additional penalty of losing all annuity benefits, sometimes based on decades of service. In some cases, individuals were reemployed by the federal government subsequent to their convictions and were denied annuity benefits based on that employment as well. Due to these effects and other concerns, Congress made major changes in the Hiss Act in 1990, or 1961. The amendments strengthened the provisions dealing with national security offenses and eliminated provisions applicable to non-security offenses. The amendments also provided for retroactive annuity benefits for individuals who had lost them based on the commission of offenses unrelated to national security. Now, the bill being considered today, while expanding the types of violations that would result in forfeiture of annuity, would apply only if the offense is punishable by imprisonment of more, for more than one year, and that's punishable, whether the sentence was for that amount or not. And as I said, even if the actual sentence imposed was suspended or what, there was probation, the annuity would be forfeited. Under certain circumstances, all the offenses listed in the bill may be punishable by imprisonment for more than one year. In 1972, the United States District Court f for the District of Columbia forbade application of the forfeiture law uh, to the very individual, uh, Mr. Hiss, whose malfeasance led to its passage. This bill would apply to acts committed after enactment, and by so providing, the effective date provision avoids that problem. Under Fe Federal Pension Forfeiture Act, the functions of the Office of Personnel Management would be limited. As with any other organization administering a covered pension system, OPM would be responsible for ensuring that the act is applied in accordance with its provisions. 
and that is something we're able to do. It would, in effect, be an expansion uh, of what we do under the existing regulations applicable to offenses upon which annuity forfeiture can be based. And uh, under those circumstances, obviously, OPM affords the individual full due process, including the right to an evidentiary hearing before an administrative law judge. So to summarize, OPM uh, is testifying in two dimensions here. One, that yes, we can administer the law should it uh, be enacted. And secondly, on behalf of the administration, that we are supportive of the, uh, of the proposed bill. So I hope that's helpful information. I'd be glad to take your questions. Thank you very much. I'm going to start the question with Mr. Waxman, who's going to have to leave the hearing to go back to they're having a Democratic conference, which accounts for some of the members not being here. He'll ask his questions first, go there, vote, and uh, then try to get back, I know. Mr. Thank Waxman. you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. There is a vote going on in the Democratic caucus, and there will be a second ballot, so I'm going to have to uh, leave in a minute. But, uh, Ms. Springer, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, we have witnessed in the past few years a series of serious incidents involving conflicts of interest, lobbying abuses, and public corruption. And some of these episodes involve Congress itself, con members of Congress, and it's clear that we must clean our own house on Capitol Hill. Yet equally serious and disturbing, we've seen a number of incidents at the executive branch of government. The indictment of the Vice President's Chief of Staff, uh, his actions relating to outing a CIA agent, fraud and other abuses in Iraq uh, reconstruction contracts, a top senior HHS official negotiating future employment while working on major health care changes, politically connected individuals appointed to senior positions with little or no relevant experience. It was disappointing to me that President barely mentioned uh, these issues in his address last night. The first step, it seems to me, uh, is to recognize a problem uh, that exists. So my first question for you is, does the administration believe that there uh, are problems concerning the ethical conduct of the executive branch, and what is the administration proposing to do to clean up the executive branch? Well, I think that the, the first step uh, is, as it relates to OPM and within our purview, is to work with you on things like this bill. We, uh, for our part in the administration, which is the oversight of the federal civilian workforce, uh, we are very concerned that high ethical standards and standards of integrity are met. Uh, certainly as a political appointee, I have to hold to those standards, but those are things that should apply to everyone. This particular act is one that, as I said, we've got a responsibility for administering as well as supporting, and the administration does support it. Uh, I would view this as just one piece. As you've noted, there's a need for a more uh, comprehensive approach, and I think that we would be willing to work with you. and. Uh, the chairman and the committee on that. Well, I also think there ought to be a comprehensive approach. This uh, issue alone, taking away pensions, is, I don't believe, going to solve the problem. I don't think you believe that either. We have to do more. Isn't that right? I think that this, uh, you know, one could question the deterrent value, if you will. I think that's part of what you may be uh, suggesting. But clearly, uh, it is an, is an important penalty. It has, a, a beyond just the pension, there are other uh, uh, things that would flow from this. For example, elimination or, uh, of health benefits. The FEHB benefits would be uh, forfeited as well as a, as a derivative of this. So it's uh, pretty far-reaching uh, as a penalty. Whether it has deterrent value would be a question. Well, one uh, major means of shedding light on the access of special interests is to require meaningful disclosure of lobbying contacts. Uh, current law requires self-reporting by the lobbyists, and there's no requirement that specific contacts or the subject matter of the meetings be disclosed. As a result, there's been little accountability in executive branch lobbying. For example, the White House has refused to disclose information about Mr. Abramoff's contacts with the White House or the subjects on which he lobbied the White House officials. We even had the Vice President of the United States chair a task force on energy, and he went to court, even to the U.S. Supreme Court, so he wouldn't have to disclose who came in and lobbied him. Does the administration support strengthening lobbying disclosure laws such that a reporting must include a description of the subject matter and the government official contacted, or such that the executive branch officials have a duty to disclose as well as lobbyists? Uh, I have not been a part of any administration deliberations on that topic, so I'm not uh, in a position to comment on that. Um, you know, uh, Does the administration have a proposal for strengthening lobbying disclosure laws? It's, it doesn't, that doesn't fall within the purview of my OPM responsibility, so I, I wouldn't be able to answer that for you. 
Another area where reform is necessary involves the revolving door between the executive branch and lobbyists and special interests, and a striking example of an existing loophole uh, in, in, in these revolving door rules is Tom Scully. He was the former head of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services who negotiated a job with firms representing pharmaceutical interests. At the same time, he was leading the administration's efforts to develop the Medicare Prescription Drug Act. Does the administration believe that it is necessary to take steps to tighten the revolving door? Uh, I don't know about the Scully case, you know, the details, and I couldn't comment there, but, um, but I do know that in my own case, because I was just a year ago planning to leave uh, a, another position I held in the administration, that I was held to some pretty high level of scrutiny and standard of uh, any kind of contact. And the way I interpreted it, I decided not to do any kind of contact with uh, potential future employers until I left entirely and severed. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that by and large, most individuals are, are uh, able to function with integrity under the current standards. Uh, you know, there may be some outliers here and there, and, uh, uh, but I think that by and large it works. One of the main means of deterring uh, and rooting out government abuse is to ensure appropriate public access to public information. Unfortunately, the Bush administration has systematically undermined our laws that promote sunshine in government. So we're facing a situation where there are deep-rooted ethical problems with little accountability. I believe it's time to take comprehensive action. I hope we can move forward expeditiously with a package that includes strengthening lobbying disclosure, closing these revolving doors, uh, restoring our open government, addressing the widespread waste, fraud, and abuse we've witnessed in federal contract in recent years, ensuring political appointees uh, for positions of public safety have qualifications other than simply being politically well-connected and preventing political interference in science-based policymaking, protecting whistleblowers who shine light on government abuses, and preventing the use of taxpayer dollars for political propaganda. Uh, these are the positions that I've taken and have introduced legislation in each one of those, and I would urge the administration to support such a comprehensive reform so that we can address uh, public corruption at its very roots. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, thank you very much. I look forward to working with you on a number of these uh, uh, issues. Let me ask, uh, Ms. Springer, um, if an individual's retirement benefits are forfeited, what happens to health benefits and life insurance coverage? They're generally, by and large, also forfeited. There are a few small exceptions. Uh, there are opportunities for uh, the government equivalent of COBRA to kick in, but in, in effect, they're forfeited mm -hmm. by and large. You know, I don't, this is not a cure-all, obviously, for what, uh, for um, public corruption, but you would hope that somebody in decision-making mode, when they are looking at uh, uh, perhaps breaking a law, this understands the downside, aside from just from going to jail, that they jeopardize their family and everything else. From That's really the purpose of doing this. We've tried to tailor, there are a number of pieces of legislation that are looking at different aspects of what uh, crimes would apply and at what level of civil service uh, this applies to. It obviously applies to members of Congress and staffs. Uh, some who are here would apply to Schedule C's in the case of my bill. Some of them go all the way down and across the bureaucracy. Does OPM have any thoughts on where it ought to apply at this point or are you just more here concerned about the implementation? Well, our focus certainly is on implementation, but uh, as we've reviewed this bill, we think it uh, certainly uh, goes uh, to a level that includes officials, public officials, that I think the uh, American, citizens, American citizens have a direct line to elected officials and to political appointees. So we think that there's a, a special standard, a high standard to which this group that you've included in your bill uh, need to adhere and that there's a special relationship with the American public that we need to be the, the tone setters, if you will. So I think that your group is very appropriate. You know, the crimes right now, there are already some crimes that cover federal workers, mostly in the espionage, sabotage, uh, treason yeah. around it, as you noted before. Uh, this st uh, takes it a step further. Under existing law, which I think now is tailored to the treason and those issues, sabotage, how many cases of pension forfeiture have there been? There have been four <coughs> cases in the past 35 or so years since uh, the last major change to that Hiss Act, that, and that's what we're operating under currently. 
in one of those cases, uh, the spouse was found to have cooperated to the satisfaction of the uh, justice uh, authorities and, and the uh, pension was restored to the spouse at its reduced level under the normal formula. Uh, but in the other three cases, there were, uh, it was a complete forfeiture. Uh, certain people availed themselves of the appeal right, <coughs> but they did not uh, prevail. So four cases. Under the legislation as we have it, if the spouse were to cooperate with the government, would the pension then could be saved, I, I would gather? It, it could be, yeah. There would be a determination made by the uh, Attorney General and the Justice Department that would uh, determine that. I mean, I, if nothing else, it's a great prosecutorial tool. When you're sitting there trying to break a corruption ring, you've got somebody who's obviously been caught with their hand in the cookie jar, but their pension's at stake. I their think that's family, true. Their family is at stake. Uh, they want to cut their losses. Uh, or a spouse wants to look what's going to happen if my husband goes away to jail and this way we, I mean, it just seems to me for, from a pro prosecutorial point of view, this is a great way to break the, to, to break the log jam sometimes. I think it's, uh, I think that's very true. I also think that um, to have the fullest effect will require OPM and other uh, officials to, and organizations to make this known to the covered population. And uh, as opposed to finding out after the fact, but I think making this known will just add to its strength. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chase. Thank you. I think this is a pretty straightforward issue, but uh, I look at it in two sides of the equation. One is I don't think someone deserves the pension if they've committed fraud and have been found guilty. The other side of the equation would be: Does this represent in any way a deterrent to fraud? Um, and I'm not sure it does. Just curious to know if, if there have been any studies that you've done, your agency has done, that would enlighten us in this issue. I'm sorry, the, uh, enlighten us as to? Whether uh, taking away someone's pension is no. a deterrent. Oh, a deterrent, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I haven't seen any studies to that effect as in the course of our review here. Uh, again, I think to the extent that the bill is known and its penalties are known, uh, I, I yeah, there are very few people, for example, today who are as familiar with the Hiss Act because it was a very narrow uh, uh, scope. But in this case, making this known, I think, could have some effect. But if you think about it, these are the, the acts that are already subject to some pretty severe criminal penalties. So this would just be one added factor. Well, the gentleman yield, but I mean, the one of the things is, is a, from a prosecutorial point of view, having that tool with the prosecutor to hang that over to get somebody uh, to either to talk or to compromise or get their spouse, I think could be helpful sometimes in breaking, if you, when you have a conspiracy or something like that. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, ask in terms of when, when employees come into the federal government, are they um, given, uh, um, I mean, obviously they know fraud is wrong. Uh, but is there um, a, a specific uh, course orientation that deals with fraud and would, in this case, let them know? I mean, I would think conceptually it would wake them up to say, you know, uh, if you've committed fraud and you're found guilty, uh, you would lose your pension and you could have many years. Um, I would think that would also have an impact. But um, is there, do we have courses on ethics that are required or are they voluntary? Uh, there are several ways that that information is given. Uh, there, I'm trying to think of my own experience. I don't think that I personally had a course, but I was directed to uh, certain website material that, that is maintained that, that covers that material, So, uh, which I obviously read. And there are obviously certain statements and representations that you make generally when you come into the political appointee positions. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that making this known, and that would be something that OPM, for example, for the federal civilian workforce, uh, the presidential appointees would uh, be happy to, to explore. Yeah, I would just observe, Mr. Chairman, it strikes me that um, those uh, employees, uh, members of Congress, whomever, who are playing on the edge uh, and have been employed for a long time would, would probably have to think twice. It, it might make them think if they had been close to the edge that they might need to pull back a bit uh, in, uh, because of the risk of actually losing the one thing that they would probably count on to, uh, to, to Well, I would say them. that if their spouse knew about it, that might add some pressure, too. <laughs> Good point. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Souter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. I have a uh, uh, first a couple uh, technical questions. In the the Hiss versus Hampton case, are you saying that, um, for example, uh, in the case of Duke Cunningham, we can't do something retroactively on his pension? I, yeah, I believe that's correct. Yes. 
So uh, the uh, longer we wait, we may have a number of, of cases that could conceivably, that, that's interesting. I mean, I understand the legal concept, but it, it shows what's in front of us in our failure to act earlier and the need uh, for fast action. Uh, secondly, um, uh, because I've, I'm just seeing legislation and trying to absorb this uh, too, if an offense is only punishable, if it's only punishable by, uh, it has to be imprisonment for a year or more, how do plea bargains affect this? In uh, other words, does it have to be a conviction where the penalty is if it's a plea bargain and the plea bargain isn't for a year or more? If, if that wouldn't change it. If you're convicted for a crime that carries with it uh, a, a penalty that could be in, uh, imposed, could be, it doesn't have to be. So even if it's less than a year for some reason or even if it was suspended or something like that, if that conviction of that particular crime carried with it uh, potentially uh, the, the uh, opportunity to impose a sentence of more than a year, then it would be applied. So the the pension would be forfeited. So the negotiated plea bargain would have to carry the uh, offense of a year or more, not the original crime? No, the crime itself for which you were convicted. Um, the, uh, uh, another uh, question I, I have uh, uh, along, well, let me, I, I was uh, concerned about your statement where you separated uh, that you believe clerical administrative employees at a very modest salary should uh, not be um, covered. Is that the administration's? No, actually, actually what I said uh, was drafted. that that they that this would apply if they're in any of the groups no, that no, are No, what I mean is your implication is you don't think they should be covered. Is no, that the administration? No, no, I'm just saying that to just, uh, to just show that it's not just at the high levels, that it would include uh, all levels of the, uh, the pay range. Does the administration support this being broader than the bill is, or? Well, we support, we've stud been asked to study and to review the, the proposed act as it's been presented here, and, and we support it as it's been presented with this group. In the private sector, um, uh, uh, the, the spousal and family questions are interesting here. In the private sector, if someone, uh, uh, do you know uh, of models in the private sector of how pension law works if somebody forfeits or does something uh, how it works with their family, do they forfeit all their pension, half their pension? Uh, what about if, if they leave the company? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answers to that, and uh, there, there may be some precedent out there that we could study and, uh, and find out for you. I don't know right off the top of my head the answer. In the current law, as it relates to, to uh, uh, bribes, false statements, and espionage, do you know if that covers narcotics? Yeah, no, it does not. So for example, in Colombia, where we had an, uh, the spouse of an embassy employee, we had uh, certain people in our government who were actually working with the cocaine traffickers, they wouldn't lose their pensions if convicted? Uh, I don't believe that the current law would cover that. Okay, if it, it's possible if it involves something that's on that list that it may, but. Uh, but, but you're not sure whether narcotics, it would depend whether narcotics. It, it, not narcotics in and of themselves, but it's in, if it's in connection with one of the security type of offenses that's listed under the current act, then it could be swept in uh, just, you know, be on that basis. In the U.S. visit program, where we had uh, clear uh, deals being made to accelerate people getting in outside, uh, many from Saudi Arabia, which is one of the more flagrant violations, um, and it, that if they were on a terrorist watch list, would that classify as a security risk or did they have to actually have committed a terrorist act? And what about uh, illegal immigration where it's not, uh, where, you, where the link is difficult here because the penalty, I mean if it, if it has to be convicted of a crime uh, where the penalty is more than one year, you could be basically letting people in on a watch list who we haven't been able to convict under U.S. visit be convicted of that, uh, but that may not be uh, national security, so it wouldn't impact your pension. Well, this particular this particular bill that that we're studying here uh, does you know it obviously adds on to the HIS bill. It doesn't you know take away anything in the HIS bill. This bill talks about the uh, the actual conviction, as you say, with carrying with it the penalty uh, potential penalty penalty of a, a year or more, and uh, that's the way this has been written. And uh, the 
beyond that scope may, might be something else that you would need to consider separately. Where I, where I disagree with my <clears throat> the implications of my uh, friend and colleague from California is he implied that suddenly corruption came un under this administration, which is laughable. Uh, the, uh, we didn't even raise the question here of presidential pardons, but even so we had multiple people in the last administration who clearly were lining up jobs while they were government employees from Monica Lewinsky to silence a sex scandal uh, that that the last administration had many of these problems too. The question of corruption is broad, crosses parties, and, 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 and needs to be addressed. One of the other problems we had in the last administration was Citizenship USA, where there were many people brought in before the campaign. We had multiple hearings in the subcommittee that was then chaired by now Speaker Denny Hastert, where I was Vice Chairman, where they would take in 7,000 forms at a time, uh, and uh, you saw the same writing on the citizenship forms and they were rushed through before the election. But under that criteria, um, uh, right now, that would not be a national security violation because citizenship questions wouldn't be covered under current law unless we pass legislation like th this that would apply. My understanding of what you said is that wouldn't be covered under current law immigration fraud, or would it? Under the current law? It would, it would not. No, it would not. Um, let me ask one other thing, because this is important as we look whether this needs to be broadened beyond elect elected officials. At our southwest border, as we deal with, with difficult questions of narcotics, of, of coyotes who are running large groups of people, uh, and of people inside the Border Patrol, uh, whether it be terrorist watch lists, whether it be narcotics, whether it be large groups of illegal immigrants, it is clear that occasionally they're penetrating our system. They're penetrating it at border crossings where there may be a cooperation when, it, when an agent comes on. They, there may be a, a no look. Uh, I don't believe it, it, it's high in our government, but it's, it's fairly consistent. But under current law, these people could keep their pensions even if convicted. That is correct. Th this, is a, this is a big problem. Uh, I'm not sure how much of a deterrent will be. I think it will be some deterrent. I'm willing to look at, at some of the variations of this, but quite frankly, it's a justice question, as Congressman Shea said. If you are, whether you're elected, it's especially egregious if you're an elected official, and we should be the first accountable. But anybody who's a public official, who's put in trust of our borders, of our narcotics efforts, of the very citizenship of the United States, that you have an obligation not to take private deals, to cooperate with people who are around that, and at the very least, the taxpayers shouldn't have to pay you a pension for the rest of your life if you're convicted. Yield back. Thank you very much. Any other comments? No, we just uh, look forward to continuing to work with the committee on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Satter, for your questions. We'll call our second panel now. Uh, we have an Shelley Pingree, who's the President and Executive uh, Officer, Chief Executive Officer of Common Cause, and Ms. Joan Claybrook, the President of Public Citizen. I want to thank you both for being here. Thanks for your patience. It's our policy. We swear witnesses before you testify, so you just rise with me and raise your right hand. Thank you. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. Ms. Claybrook, just we'll start with you. Uh, we have a light in front. Uh, your entire statement's part of the record. We have a light in front that turns uh, green when you go on, uh, orange after four, red after five. Try to stick as close to that as you can, but we want to uh, make sure you get to make your salient points, too. So, Ms. Claybrook, we'll start with you, and thank you for being with us. It's, it's green. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I'm pleased to be here to testify this morning on behalf of uh, Public Citizen and our 150,000 members nationwide. The lobby reform debate has largely focused on lobbying ethics uh, as it applies to Congress. It's my understanding the committee's discussion today really grew out of the uh, Randy Cunningham uh, case. Uh, we strongly uh, welcome your initiative to deny pension benefits to members of Congress, congressional employees, executive branch, political appointees guilty of crimes related to public corruption. But the debate on lobby and ethics reform must go beyond our legislative, that legislative proposal and beyond Congress. It must also include the ethical behavior of executive branch officials who become lobbyists and officers of companies they previously oversaw or regulated. And it should also address strengthening and monitoring the enforcement of the Ethics Reform Act for the executive branch. 
A few months ago, a report by 15 civic organizations, including Public Citizen, prepared a report called the Revol Revolving Door Working Group, and here it is, and I'd like to submit it for the record if I could do so uh, at your uh, pleasure. Uh, I'd like to submit this for the record. It's quite uh, a comprehensive uh, Without report. objection, we'll submit the uh, It's called a matter of trust, and I think it could help the committee. Uh, it shows that at least two significant lobbying and ethics problems in the executive branch. One is the pervasive problem of the revolving door by which executive branch officials rotate between public service and the private sector, typically working for the same companies that they previously rec regulated, uh, granted contracts to, or consider the effects of legislation on. The second is the loose patchwork of enforcement responsibilities spread among many executive branch agencies, investing one agency, the Office of Government Ethics, as the primary police watchdog of ethics in the, government, in the executive branch. OGE has been created more as an advisory partner to individual government agencies uh, in implementing the ethics standards. So first, I'd like to address the revolving door. Uh, in order to establish a sense of trust for government officials who are not tr um, tr that they are not trading government contracts or regulations for lucrative private sector jobs. Federal law requires a one-year cooling off period in which retiring public officials are supposed not to lobby their former colleagues in government. Additional conflict of interest laws and regulations have extended the similar cooler cooling off periods to retiring procurement officers to prevent them from immediately taking jobs with companies that have received government contracts that the procurement uh, officer had authority over. Specifically, very senior uh, executive branch officials, those in executive schedules one and two salary ranges, are prohibited from appearing as a paid lobbyist before any political uh, employee uh, in the executive branch for one year. And senior executive branch staff, those in executive uh, schedule five and up, are prohibited for one year from appearing as lobbyists before their former agency or representing or advising a foreign government or foreign political party in lobbying matters. Unfortunately, the revolving door policy has two very significant weaknesses. First, it prohibits former government officials from making direct lobbying contacts with their former colleagues, but it permits them to engage in other lobbying activity. Former officials are not prohibited from developing lobbying strategy, organizing the lobbying team, supervising lobbying efforts during the cooling off period. In fact, retired former officials frequently become registered lobbyists, lobbyists immediately on leaving the government. They simply cannot pick up the telephone, that's all. Second, the scope of the cooling off period that applies to government contracting is so narrow that former procurement officers may now immediately accept employment from the same companies to whom they had issued contracts while in public service. Only employment within a specific division of a company is prohibited if that division was under the official contracting authority, but not employment from the company itself. And this loophole, as we remember, uh, has allowed, allowed Darlene Dryan to land a well-paid position at Boeing uh, after overseeing the company's bids on weapons programs for many years in her capacity as a Pentagon procurement official. The Center for Public Integrity surveyed how the revolving door has turned for the top 100 officers in the executive branch at the end of the Clinton administration and concluded that about a quarter of the senior level administrators left public service for lobbying careers. Another quarter of the administrators accepted positions uh, as directors of private businesses they had once regulated. For, for these issues, we recommend the following. Expand the scope of the revolving door restrictions so that former officials are prohibited not only from conducting paid lobbying activity during the cooling off period, but the development and supervising of lobbying efforts. Two, expand the time period for the cooling off period to two years. Three, extend the cooling off period to senior executive branch staff of level five or higher uh, policymakers involving contracts that now apply primarily to procurement officers. Four, close the loophole allowing former government procurement officers, I mean, uh, employees, to work for a different department or division of a contractor from the division that they oversaw as a government employee, and the cooling off period should apply government wide. And five, when public officials um, discuss future employment that may pose a conflict of interest, the fact that the discussion is underway should be public information. If there's any potential conflict of interest, recusal from public officials affecting the potential employer should be uh, uh, mandatory unless a waiver from the conflict of interest rules is absolutely necessary. This relates, for example, to the Thomas Scully scandal. And then secondly, with regard to the operation of the Office of Government Ethics, um, it operates more as an advisory partner in the executive branch rather than an enforcement watchdog. Responsibility for implementation of executive branch ethics laws and regulations is widely dispersed among executive agencies 
and OGE has not served as an effective central clearinghouse for making public records on ethics matters readily available to Congress and the public. Although it is professionally staffed and independent from political operatives, OGE is far from an ideal agency. Its primary weakness is that it lacks enforcement authority. Its rules are not binding within the executive branch, but is subject to interpretation by ethics officers in each separate executive branch agency. While it has developed guidelines for granting waivers for employees from conflict of interest laws governing future employment, these are only guidelines. Each executive branch also prom uh, agency also promulgates its own waiver proce procedures, which are then interpreted and enforced by the specific ethics officer appointed within that office. As a result, there is not one set of procedures for seeking and receiving waivers from conflict of interest laws, and each set of waivers is interpreted differently by different officers. One um, of the uh, granted waivers dealt with uh, Thomas Scully, and my, um, my testimony uh, details that. The resulting uh, embarrassment uh, prompted uh, the White House in 2004 to step in and issue an executive order requiring that all waivers be reviewed by White House counsel. But this should be the responsibility of OGE, a more robust OGE, where decisions are more immune to political considerations. OB OGE has neglected to establish itself as an effective public information source as well. Though the agency compiles and scrutinizes previous government records for scores of executive branch employees um, and appointees, it makes little effort to make these records available to the public. There is no OGE website that posts public records of prior employment financial statements, conflict of interest waivers, or even enforcement actions. And when it comes to eth ethics records in the federal government, this type of information is not centralized, is exceedingly hard to secure. For the most part, OGE appears to be serving the interests of the executive branch, not the public and the Ethics and Government Act. Ironically, OGE has recently sought to weaken public disclosure of personal financial records of political employees at the prodding of the White House and some congressional leaders, the OG has been considering capping the reporting of personal wealth of senior executive branch officials at $2.5 million for disclosure, rather than the $50 million cap that, it, uh, previous, uh, that exists today, and allowing officials to omit the dates of major stock transactions from, from financial reports, which would make it difficult to tie government actions to the employee's choices. Reducing disclosure is not the way to go. Thus, we recommend three things, and I'll uh, conclude with this. I'm sorry, it took a little bit longer than your five minutes. Uh, um, given strong enforcement authority uh, for OGE, uh, with the ability to promulgate rules and regulations that are binding on all executive branch agencies, conduct investigations, subpoena witnesses, and issue civil penalties for violations. Two, empowered as a central agency for implementing and monitoring its responsibilities. Three, serve, uh, be required to serve as a central clearinghouse for all public records relevant to ethics in the executive branch and place this information on its website. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Pingree, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Um, uh, make sure your microphone's on. Turn your. Are we on? Pull it up, yeah. pull it up close. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Davis, members of the committee, uh, in particular, Representative Shays, who's worked very closely with Common Cause in the past, uh, I appreciate this opportunity to testify before you and address some of the recent scandals that have been challenging Congress and the executive branch and uh, give our suggestions about restoring the public's trust in government. As you know, Common Cause has uh, been active for 35 years on a nonpartisan basis, commenting on the issues of ethics and the influence of money in politics, and uh, we find this a very critical time. As both Congressman Davis and Congressman Waxman mentioned in their earlier remarks, uh, this is an enormous opportunity as the public reacts uh, with great criticism towards the scandals that are evident every day and more and more members of Congress are interested in finding ways to change the perspective, perspective and enforce real reform. Uh, we believe that vigorous enforcement of existing laws is critical to restoring trust. And legislation that makes clear that wrongdoing will not go unpunished is an important part of the solution to this problem. For this reason, Common Cause supports the Federal Pension Forfeiture Act. We believe this legislation that would deny federal retirement benefits to federal policyholders, including members of Congress and their staffs and political appointees in the executive branch who are convicted of crimes related to public corruption, crimes such as accepting bribes or defrauding the federal government, embezzling federal property, or falsifying federal documents. Losing a pension to us appears as if it will be a deterrent to it officials who may be considering action that betray the public trust. 
The retirement benefits that members of Congress and high-level federal employees are entitled to receive after they retire are often more than the average American earns annually from a full-time job. The fact that public servants who have seriously violated their duties to the public would be rewarded by a lifetime pension seems grossly unfair to average citizens. It seems particularly unfair when the majority of Americans can expect no pension when they retire and when corporations like Enron implode and deny millions of innocent workers their retirement savings. Passage of the Federal Pension Forfeiture Act is a good step in a multi-pronged effort to restore the public's face in government. While we do support this legislation, we believe that much more is needed. Common Cause is currently supporting an expansive reform agenda dealing with Congress and lobbying, including such issues as disclosure, gifts, travel ban, restrictions on lobbyists and lobbyist fundraising, and tremendous increases in transparency, accountability, and disclosure. We also believe that Senate leaders and House and Senate leaders of both parties should agree to establish an independent ethics commission with the power to accept complaints, investigate them, and make recommendations to the respective House and Senate Ethics Committee. And restoring, again, that public trust can only happen if the public has confidence that Congress is committed to cleaning up its own house. Within the jurisdiction of this committee, we would like to comment on a couple of other proposals before you, some of which my colleague Joan has already discussed. But we do appreciate the chairs taking this opportunity to expand the jurisdiction of the committee and looking at as many ways as possible to restore the public faith. We agree. The problem with the revolving door and the conflicts of interest when government officials with serious responsibility are looking to uh, advance their career in the public sector, um, again, has gotten out of control and is an important means of restoring the faith in the public. We were all familiar, as mentioned earlier, with former Medicare Administrator Thomas Scully's effort to conceal the true cost of the President's Medicare prescription drug plan from Congress while negotiating for a job with private sector interests that would be favorably affected by this passage. Administrator Scully got a waiver from his agency to conduct these employment discussions and since then, to, the, uh, to its credit, as, as you heard, the administration has clamped down on the practice of granting waivers. However, the time may be ripe for even stricter rules, perhaps written into the law, that simply do not allow for waivers, period. Government and legislative employees should not be negotiating with prospective employers while they have a role in legislation or regulation that affects those same employers. Political cronyism is another concern of ours, and the appointment of political cronies is a problem that has infected both Democratic and Republican administrations, but the issue has come into much sharper focus recently. When the head of the FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, turned out to have little prior experience in disaster preparedness, our ability to respond to Hurricane Katrina clearly was impaired. Unfortunately, Michael Brown's apparent political appointment is not the exception. Cronyism rears its head in other less visible appointments to boards and commissions that affect our lives. Most recently, two appointees to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, whose duty is to protect public television and public radio from political interference, were major donors and partisans with no experience in public broadcasting. These appointees have helped jeopardize the editorial independence of public broadcasting at a time when the public needs fact-based investigative journalism more than ever before. Both Democratic and Republican administrations have been guilty of placing political supporters and major donors in government jobs or government commissions, but we support the proposals contained in the Anti-Cronyism and Public Safety Act that require a political appointee responsible for public s safety to have superior credentials and experience that is relevant to the position for which he or she is being considered. We also believe that the candidates should be free of potential conflicts of interest that might arise from regulating a former employer. Let me mention a couple of others. All of our proposals, both in front of the issues that regard Congress and in the executive branch, suggest that greater disclosure is critical but currently insufficient. As we know, every day an army of lobbyists descends on Congress and the very agencies, various agencies of the federal government. Lobbying the government has become a billion dollar industry, but the public knows relatively little about what lobbyists are working on and almost nothing about who they are talking to. As Congress considers new lobbying rules in the wake of the Abramoff scandals, there are a number of common sense reforms that would greatly improve the system and should apply to the executive branch as well. Another place that disclosure rules need to be tightened is privately funded travel for federal officials. 
Federal ethics laws requires travel disclosure reports of e every executive agency. However, the Vice President's office insists that they do not have to inform the American people about the trips that are taken through them, the speeches that are made, or the special interests that the Vice President meets with. The Vice President contends that his office is not an executive agency and that disclosure rules don't apply because he does not make any trips that are privately funded. But according to the Center for Public Integrity, the Vice President has made more than 275 speeches and appearances, including 23 speeches to think tanks and trade groups in 16 colleges. While the Vice President calls this travel official business and puts it on the public tab um, and not giving the public any information of whether these trips ser truly serve the public interest or were a good use of government funds. Avoiding publicly tra financed travel is a good practice in principle, but not if it is used as a strategy to keep the public in the dark about the office's comings and going. We also want to uh, talk a little bit about government contract policies and procedures that have not been up to task. And since my time is limited, I will just say that that is yet another area of concern, particularly raised in the, uh, in the wake of Katrina, relying on s s no bid sole source contracts and feel that there is much more um, concern about disclosure and accountability in that area. We want to thank again the committee for this opportunity to discuss increasing ethical conduct, um, the opportunities for transparency and accountability in the federal government, and we too look forward to working with you as you craft these legislative proposals and think about these issues seriously. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Thoughtful testimony. Mr. Kirk, I'm going to start uh, questions with you. Mr. Kirk has a, a bill up that does much of the same thing. Uh, really, the differences on our le on the legislation, which is uh, narrowly crafted today, basically is who it applies to and what the what what crimes are, and uh, of which reasonable people can disagree. And we're trying to figure it out. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, agreeing to have a uh, member of another committee uh, uh, here for a uh, statement. Uh, last year, I introduced a bill, uh, HR uh, 4535, the Congressional Integrity and Pension Forfeiture Act. Uh, which was co-sponsored by 37 members. It was uh, based uh, almost exclusively on Congressman Randy Tate's uh, bill from the 104th Congress, H.R. Uh, 4011. Uh, that bill had 74 co-sponsors. It was taken up and passed by the House of Representatives on September 22, 1996, by an overwhelming bipartisan vote of uh, 391 to uh, 32, with one present. I'll note that um, uh, the now Speaker of the House, uh, Denny Hastert, voted for that legislation. The now Minority Leader of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, also voted for that legislation. For members of this committee, uh, the vote uh, broke out uh, uh, 16 uh, to 3. Uh, that bill uh, was patterned after a legislation introduced by my predecessor, John Porter, during the uh, 101st Congress in 1990. It was he who, in the Illinois General Assembly, passed legislation to deny a member of the General Assembly convicted of a felony of their Illinois state pension, uh, which is now the law of our state. I think it's incumbent upon the Congress now to take this action because um, the Congress, uh, by its very nature, is largely run by senior members. Junior members do not have the right to a pension. Senior members have very large pensions. Uh, the beauty of this provision is that the penalties go up with seniority. And since they are the ones who run both majority and major major minority parties, uh, the penalties fall most heavily on them. Mark, the members don't say that in their campaign literature. The That's right. members <laughs> That's don't right. say they don't run the place. Eh? <laughs> I will also just recommend- It's a rare admission. Uh, uh, on crimes uh, that are covered, I am comfortable at making the level of penalties and crimes higher on members of Congress than anyone else. Uh, because I think as lawmakers, it's incumbent on us to set a higher standard and to be judged against a higher standard. And so while there are other proposals before this committee to deny pensions to all federal employees that are convicted of a felony, or uh, to restrict the number of crimes uh, that uh, would uh, affect a congressional pension, I would recommend that this committee follow the direction that Congress took in 1996 and have a very broad uh, range of public crimes apply only to members of Congress uh, denying their pension, uh, because I think it is up to us to set a higher standard. Now, unfortunately, despite overwhelming bipartisan support in 1996, 
this legislation was killed uh, by the Senate leaders of both sides in 1996. But the Senate leaders uh, of, of 1996 are all gone now. We have entirely different leaders of both the Republican and Democratic sides. And so my hope is this Congress can send back uh, this common sense uh, legislation, which already overwhelmingly passed the House, set a higher standard for members of Congress on a broad range of public crimes. Uh, I'm very comfortable with that. I don't think we need to drag other federal employees in it, but I think for this body, a higher standard is something that we should be very comfortable with. And uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that, and I yield back. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Van Hollen. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Thank you, both, uh, both our witnesses, uh, for being here, and thank you for your, your testimony. Uh, I want to just commend the Chairman on introducing uh, this piece of legislation and holding uh, this hearing. But as he himself, I believe, said earlier, and I think we all acknowledge, uh, the scope of the problem goes beyond this piece of legislation. I support this bill, but I think uh, that if we are going to attack this issue uh, of special influence in Washington and the influence of lobbying over legislation and the product that is passes the Congress, uh, we need to go way beyond uh, that. And uh, you have addressed that, both of you, uh, in your testimony uh, as well. And indeed, Mr. Chairman, I hope this will be the first of a number of hearings where we uh, begin to take some serious oversight over this general issue. Um, let me just mention, for example, many of my constituents uh, who work for the federal government have felt that political pressure arising from special interests lobbying the administration has interfered with their ability to uh, pass public policy in the, in the public interest. Um, and you can think of many examples where uh, pressure has been put on scientists uh, in the administration to change uh, their judgments or to try and pressure them not to uh, speak out. We just heard over the weekend, it was widely reported, James Hansen uh, at NASA uh, was said that he was pressured not to speak his mind on issues of global warming uh, because it wasn't consistent with the uh, Bush administration's policy. Uh, I participated in a forum over the uh, weekend with Susan Wood, uh, who used to be a head of one of the public health divisions, uh, women's public health, uh, over at FDA, who resigned in protest after an expert panel uh, was overruled at the political level with respect to emergency contraceptive uh, and Plan B. There are numerous examples, uh, especially in the last five years, of people's independent uh, judgment uh, being overruled uh, as a result of political pressures brought by special interests. And I think it's very important that we uh, look into those issues uh, as a committee. Uh, with respect to lobbying reforms, uh, I think many of the proposals you've made here are, are right on target. Uh, and I think we should have a, a gift ban, and I'm, I think we need to be very aggressive about this. And the end result cannot just be window dressing. It cannot be attempt here to create the perception among the American people that Congress has done something if, in fact, it has not done something, because that will just breed more cynicism uh, and people will lose even more confidence um, in, in the Congress and the administration and how we make public policy. If you could address what I really think is the, uh, the, the nub of a lot of this issue, which is the whole question of the campaign finance system, and uh, we don't need to get at this point into different campaign finance reform proposals, which I support uh, many of them, and I know that uh, your organizations have been advocates, and I'm a co-sponsor of those. But just the, the nexus right now between lobbying and lobbyists for special interest and their role in the fundraising process, and whether or not you have any specific proposals aimed to address uh, that issue. Uh, thank you uh, for asking that question, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, we do believe that that's a missing link in both the Democratic and Republican proposals that are now pending uh, in the Congress. And uh, that link, as we see it, is the link between money, lobbyists, and politics. And uh, we have uh, advocated, and I would like to submit for the record, while I realize it's not totally under the jurisdiction of this committee, uh, the six benchmarks for lobbying reform that uh, Common Cause, Public Citizen, and other groups have supported and one of the uh, key uh, elements of that 
uh, is not to have lobbyists be able to bundle money for members of Congress, that is to go collect it from a lot of other places and hand over uh, a number of checks from um, various people, uh, not to be treasurers or campaign officials uh, um, for a member of Congress, uh, uh, not to hold uh, fundraising events or events that honor members of Congress, not to hold uh, events at, for example, at the political conventions that uh, are recognizing members of Congress. So uh, we believe that uh, the, this nexus of the deep involvement, if you would, uh, of lobbyists in the fundraising process for members of Congress uh, should be prohibited and that that's one step. We do support, and I know uh, Shelley does as well because she's been a leader on this in the state of Maine where she was a uh, public official. Uh, we do believe that public funding of elections in the end is really the solution. Uh, uh, and uh, we support, of course, reform of the presidential public funding system. And I think that those kinds of proposals really deserve consideration now, uh, now that we've had so many scandals and so many difficulties uh, with this nexus between money, lobbyists, and politicians. I might just make a quick comment, um, and th that is a very comprehensive look at exactly what both of our organizations is, are supporting. Um, two interesting facts, if you look at to the most uh, recent Washington Post survey, 57% of the public believes that all lobbying um, fundraising should be banned. So this is a very salient issue. People see the connection between lobbyists and members of Congress as something they have deep concerns about. As Joan said, um, we're also enormous supporters of the idea of thinking now about congressional public financing, um, and more and more conversations are revolving around this. I know uh, Representative Shays just had to leave the room, but Connecticut legislature just passed public financing with a bipartisan support from Republicans and Democrats. Um, Maryland has a bill pending, pending, so it's an issue that's um, being looked at in many states around the country. The California legislature passed public financing in the House two days ago. So in the wake of all these scandals, while there are very discrete proposals that we have to deal with and this connection between lobbying and fundraising is important, um, this conversation will go on for a while and people will continue to look at um, their members and say, so what are you doing in the long run to make sure that we break these ties and that we really change the system of in money and its influence in the political process? Well, thank you for those uh, comments, and I agree with you, and I hope as Congress uh, reviews different proposals, you will continue to hold its feet to the fire and be the judge of whether or not what comes out of Congress is window dressing or whether it's something that will make a real difference, and I agree with you. Uh, with respect to public financing. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor of a piece of legislation that's been introduced uh, here. Uh, it didn't get a lot of traction uh, until recently, and now people are fortunately uh, taking another look. But you know as well as I do that it will take an awful uh, big push uh, at, from the grassroots level uh, to pass campaign reform legislation uh, through this body. Uh, when I was in the state legislature, we pushed for it in, uh, in Maryland and we still have a ways to go there. Other states, as you said, have since uh, moved forward, which I think is a good thing. But I think that is ultimately uh, the solution for ensuring that members, rep elected members, are uh, essentially uh, owe their loyalty uh, to the, the, the public, and there's not a question raised in the public mind about whether or not there are other influences uh, at work beyond just the uh, commitment of public officials to the public interest. So let's, let's work on all these fronts, and thank you for your work. Mr. Van Hollen, I'd just like to say that it would be the best investment the taxpayer ever made. It's a cost of one B-1 bomber to have public funding of elections right. for the members of Congress. And, Mr. Chairman, if just if I could, and the, the key issue here, because when you poll people and you ask them of their priorities, where does campaign finance reform rank, for example, it usually comes down pretty low. But above that, you'll find issues like health care reform uh, and other and energy policy. The important thing is the public understand that getting the foundation of our system right has a direct impact on the policies that we work on with respect to health care and energy. And it's my view, for example, that the prescription drug bill uh, that was passed, I think people are finding out, seniors now, when they look at all the complications, that it wasn't written with them in mind. Uh, and certainly the prohibition on the federal government uh, you know, being able to uh, negotiate prices uh, on behalf of the taxpayer 
was that, that prohibition was certainly not in the public interest. And I think you see similar uh, issues arising with the energy bill. So the public needs to understand the direct connection between getting our campaign finance system right, getting our foundation uh, in, in order, uh, and the impact that has on all these other big policies. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me just note that I come from Virginia, which is uh, anything goes in terms of campaign contributions, but transparency, and we have really no history of corruption or anything else within the state. So, uh, but we do have complete transparency, and you can't raise money during legislative sessions. Uh, and the like. So we could have a good discussion on this, and I don't know if this is the time uh, to do that. I will note on some of the lobbying reforms that you have advocated forever, uh, that some members like uh, Mr. Kirk had put his bill forward last year before this became a hot item. We have a short window of opportunity to act, and, and Mr. Waxman and I have sought down, we, we'd like to take advantage of this. We're not going to agree on everything, but we can work a lot of things out and move the ball down the field. And uh, we welcome your comments as we do this. Uh, it, your criticisms and everything else, we think it adds to it. But the public right now is, is beginning to get focused on these issues, and that gives us a rare opportunity where generally this may rank 14th or 15th uh, to move it uh, to the top. Uh, so let's try to take advantage of it. We need to have an honest discussion. We're not going to agree on everything. I'm certainly not going to agree on public financing. But look, let's have the, we ought to be able to talk about it and maybe close some things that ought to be closed and try to do some, some common sense things. Well, I would, I would certainly sure. commend to you to look at uh, some recommendations by a, uh, a number of the uh, mm -hmm. same groups that are working on lobby reform on the presidential public funding system. That's a system that already exists. It's quite broken, and uh, it really needs to uh, be amended, and we would uh, seek your help on that, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay, thank you. I mean, the, the big loophole we're getting to now is the, is the court decisions that allow wealthy individuals to spend unlimited amounts. And if, if you didn't have that, I think we could, some of these other items might make some sense. Uh, but you're getting into the point where people can spend vast amounts and there's no other way. But we, uh, that's a, a discussion that we can have and try to, to, uh, to deal with. On the legislation before us, uh, this is, I don't represent this as a cure-all at all. We saw this as something within our committee's jurisdiction that we can move quickly. It may or may not be attached to something else, uh, but let's get a piece down. But uh, Mr. Waxman and I have agreed that this is not, by a long ways, not the end of what this committee will do, and we hope not what the congressman will do. And he's listed some of the things in his opening statements about some of the areas that he wants to look at, and we've agreed to look at them. And I think in some cases we'll come uh, to uh, closure. Immediately, the legislation before us in the bill that I put forward, we don't include every federal employee. We include people who are in policy-making positions for the most part, Schedule Cs. Now, some of these people don't have big pensions because they're not career, but some of them have gone in and out of government over time, and the cumulative effect is fairly uh, signi significant uh, as well. And of course, Congress, uh, who is an elected uh, a body on that. Uh, as you heard, Mr. Kirk, some would like to ex expand this across government uh, to everybody working for the federal government. Uh, we've had some discussions and, uh, on whether you do that. Uh, do you, uh, as career civil servants, do you put their families uh, out, out if they're pensioned? A any thoughts on that? Well, I'd like to look at his bill more carefully. I am an attorney, okay. so I want to do that, and I'd like to submit our comments. But generally, my inclination would be to submit uh, to to support a, a broader piece of okay. legislation uh, like Mr. Kirk's. I worked in the federal government for 16 years. Yeah. Uh, I started as a GS-5, so I know uh, the uh, capacity of um, uh, individuals in the federal government to misbehave, and I've seen it. A and, uh, oh, sure. So I think that um, it, it, I, I do believe it would be a deterrent if people thought they could lose their pension. Many people go to work for the government and stay there because it does have a good pension system, and particularly in these days where pension systems now are hard to come by, it's probably even more important. So yeah. I would not be opposed to, um, to looking more broadly at uh, what these uh, penalties should be okay. and uh, who they should cover. I certainly think they should cover the SES uh, positions. I'm not sure whether he, uh, the bill does that or not, That's a good but point. Uh, I, I d definitely think uh, all political appointees and the SES positions. But okay. I think probably more broadly. Right, if you if you'd like to submit anything else, we may move on this quickly, but we'd be happy to have it, Ms. Pingree. And I would concur with Joan and just uh, reinforce again the the public perception from the outside of people who work for the federal government, who are members of Congress, who basically um, you know work for all of us having opportunities to keep their pension even if they do significant wrongdoing. So I, I do think it would be a deterrent effect. I thought your comment that it would be a prosecutorial tool was important, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. in a time when um, 
there's a great need for access to information, and we see in the Abramoff issue where being able to have that information is extremely important to cleaning up what goes on behind the scenes that we often don't know about. So I, I thought that was an important point, and I don't, I don't know exactly what the legal issues are, but again, um, I think perhaps it was Representative Shea who, Chase who mentioned that um, as people come into these jobs, they need to be fully informed about the fact that there will be significant penalties if they do wrongdoing and, and attach those to every decision that they're making um, when they make those decisions. So I, I think we would support that. Okay. Uh, thank you. I just had one other question, Ms. Claybrook. I'm just uh, confused about one thing. You, t you suggested that OGE has sought to weaken public disclosure at the prodding of the White House. Was that, was that fair? Well, no, it was the White House that took the initiative. The White, right. uh, oh, uh, oh, yeah, White House is prodding OGE to weaken these things. Yes. But uh, have they been successful in that? I don't know. I haven't uh, okay. had the capacity to uh, to. Because our hope that. is that OGE uh, is is has been immune from political considerations. I mean, that's why it's created originally, and that's why I think we want to give them more authority in some of these areas. That's yeah. correct. Uh, we very very strongly believe that OGE should have uh, independent authority, and um, that uh, it should be as immune as possible from political uh, considerations. Obviously, if you get a directive from the chief of staff of the White House. Um, you're going to pay attention to it. Of course you are, and there are right, political right. considerations right. in everything. You don't have That's to be elected right. to have. Uh, i just add one other thing. There are going to be times when career people come up with a different conclusion than the elected administration. That's right. Uh, and we've seen some of those issues, too. Uh, yes. My feeling on that, though, is the administration shouldn't be afraid to come forward and explain their position Absolutely. if it's at variance. But there's nothing wrong with that, whether it's no. voting rights or whether it's uh, on drugs. or But if it's a policy position, that's fine. But they shouldn't be timid about sharing their information with Congress and coming forward and explaining it. That's correct. That happened to me as, a, as actually at the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And John Dingell and I had quite a set to over this because one of my employees didn't like airbags. And we had a public debate about it. And I supported airbags. And um, I think in the end, having that public debate was just yeah. perfect. It's never pretty, but it's democracy. That's and that's, right. uh, ag again, the elected policymakers can overturn career people, but they should not be afraid of being able to come up forward and explain that's it. And that's what, well, thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I regret that I was not here with, uh, when uh, these uh, very important witnesses uh, testified. I've, I've had a chance to glance quickly at their testimony. I certainly wanted to be here when uh, the OPM director testified. Um, uh, a member, and I, I, I don't re recall his name on the other side, was, um, was saying uh, as I entered that he thought that members of Congress uh, should be held to a higher standard. Um, I must say that I have to agree. Um, we, of course, passed legislation uh, that said that, at the very least, members ought to be held to the same standard as others. But can we, you know, isn't it amazing that it took us a long time to get to the point uh, of saying that the laws that apply to everybody else, hey, guess what? They also apply to members of Congress. Uh, now that we've said that, and now that we have this um, pervasive scandal, let's look to see who a member of Congress is. And, uh, when it comes to uh, matters of ethics and the, the fact that there are so few of us that these positions are so sought after, are the highest uh, public trust, uh, I, I, and, and it, particularly in light of the scandals before us, it is very hard to argue anything but set the example, not only raise the standard, but say, look, they have a higher standard that applies to them than applies to the average American. So I simply want to say that however that plays out, and we have to look closely at how that plays out, and indeed I have a question for you about how that plays out, um, uh, I do think that that's certainly the place to begin. I want to congratulate my good friend who has made the first hearing, a hearing dealing with uh, uh, this um, uh, egregious uh, issue now, what he's done is to, to choose the most egregious case, the case that is um, mind-blowing uh, to anyone who knows anything about it, but if I may say so, it, for that reason, it is not the most urgent case. In some respects, it's the easiest case because you know you got to do something about that if the lobbying can, uh, can result in um, 
the, 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 uh, the, the consequences that we now know uh, from the plea, then you, the first, you certainly got to do something about that. Um, I would have preferred, and I know it's early uh, in the session, and that's why I'm grateful that we've started uh, at least. I would have preferred, and I think uh, there would have been a greater understanding, particularly of the public, if we said there are a whole bunch of things that uh, are wrong and that, that's wrong with that member, because everybody knows how unusual that is. And if they don't know, beware Congress, because too many think that he is typical. Uh, and uh, one way to dispel that is to say, is say, here's a whole flock of things we're going to do. So I'm going to assume that m my good friend Tom Davis, who, who's taking the leadership here, the first committee to come forward in this way, uh, is having the first of a series of important hearings on this issue. Um, uh, I believe that um, the matter ranks so low, as my, my colleague here from Maryland said, because we have failed to make the nexus between the issues that affect the American people and lobbying. So we talk about lobbying, who could care less what happens in Washington? And maybe it's difficult to make that nexus, but not if we begin to talk more about uh, the issues that we know have been determined exclusively by lobbying money. And of course, the best and prime example is uh, the great hopes of seniors that have been dashed by the Medicare prescription drug program. Not only uh, is it uh, uh, indefensibly complicated, but now, they, 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 now it's, it's so full of holes uh, that they can't even work their way through it because there's yet a, new, a whole new set of problems that have just erupted. Uh, we gotta do better on, on that. Um, um, I, I, I would like um, um, to, to, to just ask a question. When I look at these things, I tend to look at them legislatively and more technically. Um, the notion, one of the things I found, find most difficult, because it's hard for me to see what difference it has made, um, is the notion of, of you know, one year or two years uh, that you don't get to lobby. Now, in, um, I guess it is the common cause testimony, um, uh, to show just how difficult this is, uh, in your explanation of the revolving door, you understand that people have to have a right to uh, practice an occupation, so you say slow the re revolving do door. But to show, it how, show how hard it is, in your explanation you say, and here I'm quoting from your testimony, uh, uh, expanding the definition of lobbying will capture those members of Congress who join lobbying law firms and who do not register as lobbyists, but who share their invaluable, ex share their invaluable experience they have had as elected officials with lobbyists in the firm. I, I, it, I find that a very difficult uh, 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 <laughs> matter to deal with. It, you know, on the face of it, it seems to have um, free association and free speech implications. I don't even know how in the world you would enforce it, uh, and I'm bothered by it. At the same time, I can't tell the difference between one and two years. So it, it would help me if you have anything further uh, to say, because the, what, the rest of the things you say under that I hope we'll do immediately, like eliminate floor privileges, uh, uh, you deal with negotiation for employment contracts, um, prohibit lobbyists from being, being, being the treasurers, et cetera. But when it comes to, you know, <laughs> uh, okay, you can't even talk to, you can't share your experience, I don't know how that can survive constitutional muster, much as <laughs> I'm attracted to it. And, and I just, uh, so I, I, I just like to hear you, perhaps you have views on why you think that is constitutional or why that would work, or why it would be, for that matter, enforceable. Uh, well, thank you, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, attempt to answer that question. And again, Public Citizen has been doing a lot of work on this issue mm -hmm. of the revolving door. Uh, I would say that for most of the reform groups, we've been trying to address um, two concerns. One is to extend the period of time, and, and, and you raise a good question, you know, will one year be different from two years? We, we feel that it represents a, 
uh, you know, a greater deterrent from this notion that people, you know, serve as members of Congress, um, looking forward to an opportunity to um, both parlay that influence um, into uh, a high paying job and um, maybe are making decisions based on their time in Congress that will affect, be affected by that future employment. So I think we're trying to extend that period um, and talking about it in the executive branch as well. And I think the second um, point that, that you've raised um, that perhaps will be hard um, to actually regulate is this concern that there are former members of Congress or the executive branch who actually go to work in large lobbying, large um, law firms that have a significant lobbying presence. So they may have the opportunity to direct lobbying activities, to work on strategies and you know political thinking, yet they may never appear on the floor or be seen in these halls. Um, but their, their influence and the significance of that influence may be much greater than we're able to um, assess based on whether or not they're here in the hallways. Yeah, and we may have reached the limit of what we can prohibit is my problem with and, that. And, and, and you may well be raising an important mm -hmm. point, but it's, um, it's really one of the most frequently mentioned proposals because I think people are deeply mm -hmm. concerned about what's going on behind the scenes. That same member could go and teach at Georgetown Law School uh, and, and say the very same things, and then the lobby should, should simply register for his course. <laughs> I mean, and people do do that. They do, they do teach part time. So I'm just not sure about that, and I'm not sure, as much as I want to do something about this problem, that I could, um, because I think it's unconstitutional on its face, not just as, as applied, um, not to mention all kinds of problems about attorney client uh, uh, problems. The reason I ask it is only I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm befuddled by the one and two year and I see the problem there and therefore respect your notion of trying to get to something that, that is more meaningful and it, to, to, to me in a real sense it points up the difficulty of trying to do something other than the, the, yearly, uh, the yearly matter. I'm sorry, Ms. Claiborne did want could to I come in, Could I come in on that, uh, Mr. Chairman, for just a second? Um, well, first of all, I understand your, your concern about the constitutional issues. Uh, the reason that we favor this type of proposal is because the intent of uh, the current law that you not uh, lobby for one year after you leave Congress has been completely undermined by uh, members of Congress being paid multi-bucks to go to a, either a lobby firm or law firm, and they set up shop as the director of uh, the um, the issue, uh, maybe Mr. Tozan would be a good example, where uh, behind the scenes is directing the lobbyists, telling them what to do, which members of con Congress to contact, what issues that they uh, care about. And so he's essentially the lobbyist without actually making the telephone calls. A and uh, everyone knows that, that, that uh, Tozan's lobbyists are coming to talk to them and they're bringing a message from Mr. Tozan for example. So, uh, I, and he's not the only one, believe me, I'm not picking just on Mr. Tozan. Uh, uh, so the question is um, whether or not um, members of Congress can sell themselves to these uh, entities, these law firms and lobbying shops, uh, as the director of um, working on particular issues where they have intimate knowledge and intimate contacts that uh, is essentially selling the public trust. And it is a balancing act, it is a balancing issue. I would prefer that they not be able to work for five years in these kind of jobs, if you ask me personally, because there are plenty of things members of Congress are talented to do, and they don't have to become Washington lobbyists in order to make a living. And I think it's perverted the system and undermined the whole uh, process of legislation. So I'm very, I would apply a much tougher standard uh, in terms of the number of years, and I think that you would admit that there's a difference between one year and five years. Uh, in terms of whether members of Congress are still here and the staffs are still here, and can the, do they have the same relationships? Mm -hmm. But in terms of directing and, stra and controlling the strategy or, or, or uh, laying out the strategy for other lobbyists to um, affect uh, legislation on their behalf, uh, um, hopefully there is some way that we can write that that would pass constitutional muster with you as a great lawyer and uh, the courts uh, so that there would be some distance, if you would, between members of Congress and lobbying on issues uh, that they were. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chase. I, I think this issue is pretty straightforward. It, it's just something that needs to happen. I, I, though you all in your testimony have obviously gone beyond this issue and, and so uh, I'll seize the opportunity to talk about that. 
Um, both of you would ban gifts entirely? Yes. I, uh, the yes, recorder yes, can. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Yes, sorry. <laughs> the, um, uh, what I wrestle with in terms of trips, tell me what trips you would allow. We would allow? Yeah. Well, uh, that's an interesting issue that I think that our collective judgment has not yet um, uh, make. Um, you don't have to be so collective. So sorted out. I'm not asking you to be collective. <laughs> I'm asking each of you to, to talk as independent thinking people. What would you allow? Well, we haven't had a, the kind of conversations that would, I don't would allow the, us to I sort don't, that, but I'm going to tell you. I don't understand the word we. Okay. I'm uh, asking we at public you. Citizen. Okay. We at public citizen. Um, but, uh, I believe that if a member of Congress is doing the public business, the public treasury ought to pay for that trip. Okay. And uh, the one issue that has been raised in the Senate uh, to us has been uh, whether or not nonprofit organizations and not the ones that are front groups for lobbyists, but uh, educational institutions, for example, should be allowed to pay the travel of a member of Congress to, say, make a, a graduation speech. And I mean, that no, I'm, I'm wrestling with these things. Uh, I'm interrupting you. I'm sorry, but yeah. um, I'm not quite sure what you're, where you're really coming down. Well, I don't know either on that okay. particular issue. Well, let really me well then let's just, uh, just uh, ask on a question. On that narrow issue, I, I would say all other travel that's on the public purse. See, what I'm, what I'm wondering uh, is, as I wrestle with this, uh, are we going to do something that I ends up being superficial uh, in the process of trying to look like we're doing something and really not getting at the issue. I mean, it seems so clear to me if you go uh, on a trip to Scotland to play golf at all the best courses and they're spending thousands of dollars just for the, the, uh, the fees uh, on, on the golf course, I mean, that's like a no-brainer. It shouldn't happen. Right. But I'm, I'm thinking um, if I'm invited to give a speech to a group from APAC in Miami, should that be allowed? Now, um, that's the question. And I'm not sure who APAC is, I'm sorry. Well, any group. I'll just well, use APAC. And any group that is a, a business group or a lobby group, uh, absolutely not. I, I believe well, that. Well, then now let me ask you this. If uh, I'm uh, going to raise money in Miami, um, how do I pay for that if it ends up being the, very, the, the same kind of group? Out of your campaign fund. But then what's the difference? I mean, with all due respect, I mean, they gave you the money and they put it in your campaign. I, that's where I think it, there's no way that you, there's no way that I think we're going to want to say to someone that the only way they can raise money is in their district. I mean, that's easy for me. If everybody in Round Hill Road in Greenwich, Connecticut <laughs> gave me a contribution, right. I could run for president. Right. Right. But uh, what does someone do in, in a very poor district? Uh, what does someone do when they are the spokesman on a particular group? If my opponent, for instance, goes to every law firm in the district uh, to raise money, uh, is she also allowed to go to every law firm outside the district? And why not? If I am the champion of tort reform and the law community doesn't want to support me at all, but the medical community does, why wouldn't I want to and why wouldn't it be logical that a group in Miami or Chicago or somewhere else would want to contribute to my campaign and why wouldn't I go to a fundraiser? I particularly think of senators. I mean, senators go all over the country doing this. Well, they, they can. They just have to pay for it. It should be paid for out of the campaign but fund. But then just tell me, how's that any different? You got the campaign dollars from the very group that you went to do the fundraiser with. That's right. But, but What's I, the difference? I, I, I think that, well, I think that there is a difference because if you get it directly from the, um, the medical association or whatever it is that wants to bring you in, and then they're going to raise big bucks for you, uh, um, then you're getting it from them and they're paying for your, okay. for your money. And I know that it counts in terms of your campaign so fund, what happens, but I still think that what, it's what happens if that same medical community invited me to give a speech about something I believe in and only paid for my travel, only paid for my hotel, and maybe paid for the dinner that night, how is that any different? I don't see the difference. That's what I wrestle with. And what I also wonder about is think of what the causes you believe in, and I believe in your causes. You are basically saying to me that I can't go and speak and rally the nation for campaign finance reform, which I believe in, that I'm stuck in my district. 
And the only way I can get outside to rally people on something like campaign finance reform is if I do a fundraiser. No, no, no. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you're doing the public's business, then the public should pay for it. You come out of the federal treasury. So out you're of saying that if I want to go to San Francisco to talk about campaign finance reform, I've got to – and where do I get the money from? What, what fund do I get it from here? I believe there should be a congressional fund to pay for the travel. I would far rather that you travel every day and have the public pay for it if that's what the Congress agrees to, if there's some system right. for deciding who gets that, the, the allocation of those funds, than to have it paid for by private business. Okay. I think that that is the harm, because once you say that's okay, then it extends yeah. and extends I, I and extends. I think that's a consistent policy. I mean, I could, I could argue that. That's almost like saying that, that government pays for your campaign, but you would take that same analogy and say, uh, I would take it out of basically out of my uh, my office expenses if I wanted to travel to give. But a speech I think there ought to be a larger fund that's put together, whether okay. it's allocated by a member of Congress, how, by a committee, maybe a combination yeah. of both. That uh, that's who pays for your travel, and you report it publicly, and you report on what you did and said. That's publicly available very quickly. Right. Then me, I think the public could live with that. Okay, let me ask uh, Common Cause what they think. Um, well, I thought you made a, a, an important point when you when you started out this conversation, and I think it does get to the heart of um, what's going to be a plethora of conversations about what's real reform here. Because as everyone has stated, there's going to be a kind of rush to pass a variety of fixes on what's perceived as uh, you know corruption here in Washington, and the danger is, I think, going after things that are too small and aren't appropriate fixes, and creating an even more complex system of what you can and can't do. So I do think you're addressing an, a, an appropriate concern, and in a way it requires us all to back up, and of course it's why you know uh, organizations like ours, and certainly you've been a champion of this in the past, talk about until we end the nexus between money and politics, and until we really talk about public financing for congressional offices, there will always be this question. Were you at that meeting, or did you go on that trip, or were you at that lunch, so that someone could have closer access to you okay. and an unfair Let advantage? Let me just ask this last question, because I've run out. But when I was invited to speak to the League, League of Women Voters in Florida with Marty Meehan, I want you to tell me how I would get there. Well, I, I mean, I think Joan makes a perfectly good point. We, we have to talk about separating this because it's the whole issue around travel. So just travel. answer the question. So how would I We pay? should have a public fund. You should pay for it. It should be an important part of your job, expanding both who you're able to speak to and, and what you're fair able enough. to view no, around okay, the world. Enough. We Thank have you. to change the system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Waxman. I want to thank both of you very much for your uh, presentation to us. I, I'm pleased that you're here because it expands the perspective of this issue from the bill that we have before us, which is to deny uh, pensions to people who are convicted of crime, certain people, uh, if, they're con if they're convicted. I, I think what we need is honesty. We need honest leaders and we need open government. And open government is very important to keep people honest. I, I, I often wonder when I hear about a colleague uh, doing something that's so outrageous, taking a bribe, you, you wonder, what was this person thinking? Well, most people commit crimes think no one will ever know about. <laughs> now, one of the problems I see is that under current law, only the lobbyists, not the officials they lobby, are required to make disclosures about the fact that they're, they're, they're lobbying, and <coughs> a lot of them don't bother. Well, uh, we don't enforce that law. I saw somewhere that it was something like 80 percent of people who lobby don't bother to, dis to live up to the, the, the lobbying laws that are on the books now. It seems to me that there's a lack of accountability uh, regarding lobbyists in the executive branch. Don't you think it would make more sense for people who are being lobbied to have to disclose the fact that they were lobbied and the subject matter? There's nothing wrong with it, by the way. I think lobbyists serve a very important purpose. They represent different interest groups, and we don't want to pass legislation without getting all the, the input and views of various groups. But I, I think back to the time when Vice President Cheney chaired a, an energy task force to come up with a proposal for legislation. He wouldn't even hear from people that would tell him th what the President said last night, which is our country is addicted to oil and we need to break that addiction. One of the ways to break the addiction is to be more efficient in the use of oil. 
His view, uh, he stated publicly, was eh, it's virtuous, but it's not a good policy. Well, I hope the president's uh, views last night will become the policy for this country. Let's be more efficient in the use of energy. Let's make sure we look for alternatives. Let's wean ourselves off this addiction. But if we wanted to look at who the vice president was hearing from as he did this official job of trying to develop an energy policy for the administration, it seemed to me a real realistic question to ask is, what groups did you hear from? What did they ask you about? He took such offense at that question that he went to the U.S. Supreme Court to argue that he didn't have to disclose such information. Do you think there ought to be a requirement that people who are, who are lobbied in the executive branch have to have, to have a disclosure of, of the fact they've been lobbied and, uh, and what position was being advanced? I do. Um, as a public official, my calendar was public. I believe that uh, the, the calendars of public officials ought to be clear and public. And uh, from time to time, public citizen has seen some problems, and we have asked for, for calendars, and we've been turned down. In other cases, we've gotten them. But I think there ought to be a clear rule. That is, that, that the calendar uh, of uh, public officials should be a public calendar. Is that and subject to FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information it, Act? It is, but there have been different rulings, and at this moment I can't remember them all, but in some cases I know we've gotten the calendars, and in others we haven't. I'd be glad to submit a memo to you on mm -hmm. uh, our understanding of the current uh, law uh, under the Freedom of Information Act. It's one of our specialties at Public Citizen, mm -hmm. and I'll be happy to give that to you. Uh, but I do believe that the law ought to be clear, and that uh, when public officials have meetings, they ought to be public. Um, not that everyone ought to be able to join them and come. Surely they can have private meetings, but I think that what, who was at the meeting and what the subject matter of the meeting was about should be public. And we've also had this fight with the Office of Management and Budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been from time to time, every time we raise a big stink about it, then uh, every once in a while they say, oh, John Graham said, oh, we're gonna have a public process, and then of course it wasn't a public process after the the hullabaloo died down. I'd like to have a clear rule in the law. Well, I think open government is very important, and one of the problems that I'm seeing is that this administration is restricting the release of information under the Freedom of Information Act. They sent out mandates to agencies to stretch FOIA exemptions to withhold, quote, sensitive, end quote, information. Now, there's nothing in the law that says you can withhold information that's sensitive. They even came up with some pseudo-classification designations, such as, quote, sensitive but unclassified. Now, if it's classified and you're revealing national security matters, well, I think all of us would agree that shouldn't be disclosed to the public. But if it's classified as sensitive but unclassified to avoid disclosure, it seems to me this administration is going out of its way to figure out how to undermine openness in government. Well, th I, I agree with that, Mr. And uh, I want Mr. you Wack, just. Uh, I would like to mention one other thing, though. But I, just because I see my, my yellow light, I'm just going to suggest to you that I would appreciate if you look at uh, the law that I propose called the Restore Open Government Act, H.R. 2331. I'd be interested in having your opinions on uh, that legislation. And then I just quickly want to touch one other thing. I think that when we have people like Tom Scully, who was representing the administration, he got a waiver to go out and negotiate a job with companies that represented the pharmaceutical industry while he was negotiating the Medicare prescription drug bill. You mentioned Billy Tozan. It wasn't that he went to work as a lobbyist for the drug companies. What offended me was that while he was negotiating the bill relating to Medicare, he was in obvious conflict of interest because he was, he was working on the legislation and doing things that benefited the pharmaceutical industry. Now, I, I just think that um, that sort of thing has to be tightened up. We shouldn't allow people to be in a conflict of interest situation. Part of it is to have openness, but I don't think the administration ought to give waivers to a guy like Tom Scully. And I, I think that we can't even reach, this is a violation of the ethics for uh, Congressman Toza, but there's nothing we can do to him because he's gone. Right. Now he's the, making $2 million a year at the uh, chief person at the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, or Pharma. So I just raise these issues, appreciate your input on them, and I think that we need to do more than this piece of legislation. We need to look at it in the broader. Well, point. we certainly agree that the ethics, uh, that the, the waivers for uh, conflicts of interest ought to be very narrow and very uh, unusual. Uh, um, I just want to comment on the Freedom of Information Act. One of the things that's undermining the Freedom of Information Act today, and I believe it's within the jurisdiction of this committee, uh, uh, is the issue of attorney's fees. 
when the law was originally uh, amended in 1974, it included attorney's fees. Now, uh, under some very unusual court decisions, uh, you can only get attorney's fees if you get a clear win in the case. But if you're like 90% through the case, and the government comes in and negotiates and says, we're going to give you all the documents now because they realize they're going to lose, you don't get attorney's fees. And I think that that, that uh, perversion of the original intent of the law uh, really has undermined the likelihood that people will bring these cases. A and we would love to have a, a, a small amendment uh, in whatever bills that you do in terms of public disclosure to rather encourage people to raise issues. Uh, you don't always win and um, you, you don't always uh, get your attorney's fees, but you're much more likely to uh, if, uh, if you, the government concedes, whether they concede because the court made it the final ruling or whether the government conceded because it gave in. Well, we ought to reward people who try to get information right. and not punish whistleblowers who try to disclose information. Right. I think those two concepts right. should both fit right. within legislation right. that's in the jurisdiction of this committee. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McHenry, you got any questions? Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Um, the question I have for both of you is that you know, we're, we're imperfect in the, in the laws that we have in this nation. Um, and no matter the, the set of laws that we put out governing lobbying and ethics in government, there will always be a criminal element that will try to find a way around those laws. For instance, in the, in the matter of Duke Cunningham, uh, the disclosure forms that we as members of Congress fill out, there is one exemption, and that is your home mortgage. <laughs> now, it, it's very unique that you have to disclose whether or not you have a savings account that has $4 in it. You have to disclose the institution it's in. You have to disclose the amount of interest you derive from that $4 through the course of a year. But you can have a mortgage for a home, or no mortgage at all, and an enormously expensive loan, uh, home. Uh, so the question I have for you is, are you coming forward with a sunshine proposal, um, rather than simple restrictions, to just provide the public with more information? Well, I would address that in two ways, and I, I think you're correct that um, just uh, providing a variety of new rules won't necessarily stop first criminal behavior and then maybe behavior that's uh, of questionable ethics. Um, so, I mean, two of the things that we've focused on, particularly in the broader perspective of Congress, but also in some ways affecting the executive branch, are a tremendous amount more disclosure um, and information available to the public about the people who, in fact, work for them, so that uh, that information is more readily available and people can make those judgments on their own. But the second part um, that I think would have a significant effect, again, when, when people are intent on breaking the law, um, at you know, whatever system you're working in, you can't stop someone from breaking the law. But it's been very clear in terms of the ethics process here in Congress, um, there's been very lax enforcement. And in many of these cases, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, many of those who are already regulated aren't bothering to fill out travel disclosures, gift disclosures, all the things that should have been done, and it's obviously gone to a much deeper level. We propose um, an independent ethics commission, which is employed in over 30 states around the country, um, to have a level of outside complaints, to have a level mm -hmm. of higher disclosure and enforcement, um, and we just think it's an important juncture here. While people are looking at their deep concerns about whether there is, um, you know, outrageous amounts of corruption here in Washington, but on the other hand, um, is the fox guarding the hen house and is the job being well done? So we think, again, to restore confidence, there has to be an independent ethics commission and it has to have very strict guidelines about um, how okay. it brings these concerns to light. Uh, if I were you, I would, um, if you were pushing this, I would uh, cite James Madison in Federalist Paper number 57 because what he says is that the purpose of every constitution is not only to have the best rulers, but he says, in the next place, take the most effectual precautions for keeping them virtuous while they continue to hold the public trust. And I think that that's the issue, really, that we've raised with regard to the Office of Government Ethics here uh, in this hearing today and okay. also with the lobbying. I have two, fi two other questions, so I want to keep yeah. moving forward if we could. Is the timing of a contribution an evil? Well, 
um, it certainly can be associated with an evil, as some of the people who are currently under indictment would suggest. Um, and I think that it raises, again, public perception and questions about whether the timing of a contribution was related to a decision that a policymaker made. And no one can be free of those questions, and the, and the more opportunities you have to either regulate that process, allow more disclosure of that process, or prohibit it, um, okay. the better off lawmakers will be. Ms. Claybrook? It, that's a very difficult question, but uh, yes, there are, there are times when you can say um, a member of Congress got a contribution just before, after they introduced a bill, they um, voted on a particular piece of legislation, it's very controversial. Yes, you could say that. Uh, um, it, it's, I don't think that it's the most important issue. I think that the most important issue to me is that there be very clear rules about how you can behave. Obviously, today you can accept campaign contributions. We believe the public funding of elections would end a lot of this. Even free TV would cut down the burden on members to have to do the money machine fundraising constantly and would help to solve this problem. Okay. It's interesting, the inconsistency here, because also lobbying. You say that a, a, a one-year addition to the one-year ban on members going and lobbying um, would cut down on corruption, yet you say you have to fully ban money in politics. Well, I think so why you, not fully ban lobbying? <laughs> well, the Constitution won't allow that, and you're not going to ban money. What you're going to do is you're going to give members of Congress an opportunity under the public funding bills to uh, opt in to take public funding so they don't have to take uh, private money. Uh, there will have to be some kind of a, uh, an initial screening device, small contributions or uh, petitions or something to qualify for public funding, but it's, it's an option for the member of Congress. It's not mandated. Okay, because there are many of us that, that believe that both lobbying um, and money in politics uh, have the element of free speech and that full disclosure is what we should be all about rather than simple limitations because when you put those arbitrary limitations, you create other problems that are unintended, and, and I think we're dealing with some of those here in Washington, just as we were uh, 20 years before with similar public corruption issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Clay, any questions? I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask both of the witnesses. Uh, We've heard a lot of proposals come forward about reform. However, I have not heard anyone mention uh, the practice, I guess it's a little known practice, of lobbyists uh, giving to uh, the, say, the DCCC and the RNCC uh, in the name of a member. Uh, and, and giving that member credit for, say, a $5,000, $10,000 contribution. Don't you think that that, that also, that practice also kind of, kind of allows for a cozy relationship, allows for, for um, favoritism? Uh, I'd like to hear, hear, hear you. Both of your, your thoughts about that, has, has, it, has anyone looked at that and suggested any kind of reform to that practice? Uh, again, um, I, I think it's why uh, we're such staunch supporters of changing to a system of public financing of elections, because one of the things, as you've rightly observed, is um, in spite of a tremendous amount of reform to the system of soft money and, and in terms of more disclosure, um, there are always those who will find a way around the back door and another way to make sure that you're allowed to use a certain amount of money to influence a member and a member's decision. And at its very core, uh, that, that's what we're trying to get at. In, in, a, in effect, although I, I know that people often for, feel we're placing a burden on elected officials, in a sense we're trying to relieve this burden of any of these questions. You know, did you get the contribution <laughs> the day before you took the vote? Did the money go to the party instead of you, but they called you up and said, oh, by the way, I put some money in the party. And I mean, these are things that, that frankly, you shouldn't have questioned about the behavior and the decisions that any of you make. Um, and the, the fact that there is so much resistance about this sometimes shocks me because uh, the ability to be an elected official and never have to wonder um, whether people will suspect that you got the money because um, some organization feels that you're a good supporter of theirs or you got the money because they were counting on you doing something after you got the money, I, I just think is something we should eliminate the process and there is no better time than now. Uh, ditto. 
would you, well, has, has anyone brought that, that, that subject up in the form of, uh, of legislation? Uh, has, no, no, has anyone no. proposed eliminating that practice? Well, uh, as far as I know, it's not an authorized practice. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a uh, backdoor, you know, wink and nod informal communication. So it's kind of hard to prohibit that. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's, I believe it's a very informal thing. I don't, uh, because it's not, as far as I know, I don't know maybe, uh, uh, something maybe. that's a matter of record. I know what happens. Well, perhaps you all should look again because you will find that both uh, congressional campaign committees give credit to members. Right. Uh, because they direct a lobbyist to put to put money into the, to uh, uh, into those committees, and they and the member gets credit for it. So I mean, that's just what, I think it's an oversight that all of your groups have okay. missed, and you may want to take a look at it. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman, um, Ms. Watson. I think you're next. And thank you. Time. I would like to tell the two panelists that we appreciate you coming because you represent the public trust. And uh, I found myself being elected into a culture of corruption. And uh, I've been very agitated by it throughout my term. Have the two of you looked at the ethics laws already on the books? And what I feel is that we as a Congress have abdicated our responsibility because we have very few oversight hearings. We have very few whistleblowers to come in and testify. And uh, it seems like we have bypassed uh, what I feel are offenses that should be brought to the public's attention. For instance, we've not held a, an ethics hearing uh, since both parties sat down and negotiated its composition. So can you respond uh, to this question? Are there not adequate provisions already in law that will cover whatever uh, offenses that might come about by members or do we need new legislation? I know we're talking about the forfeiture, forfeiture of uh, public pensions. That's certainly a new area. But are there not enough provisions, but they lack compliance? Can you well, respond? Well, I'll, I'll speak first. I know Shelley has some very strong thoughts on this as well. Um, first of all, uh, in the Senate, an outside party is allowed to file a complaint with the Ethics Committee. In the House, that's been prohibited. We used to be able to, we now cannot. And as a result, the uh, two parties are, find themselves in a position where if, if a member of Congress files an ethics complaint against a member of the other party, rarely does, do they do it to a member of their own party, then it becomes a, a, a game of warfare. And then they're filing complaints against the other party. And so what happened was, that after all of the hullabaloo over um, uh, in, in the late 1990s, what happened was that they came to a deal. We won't file a complaint against you. You don't file a complaint against us because it's like nuclear war. A and I think that that's been uh, a terrible result. And so a, a major thing that we think is that, that outside parties should be able to file complaints uh, in, in, the ethics in the ethics committee. But more importantly, or as, as importantly as that, we, th we see the Ethics uh, Committee as uh, totally disabled and unable to enforce the law, and we think there ought to be an outside um, independent Office of Public Integrity or Commission that uh, is not staffed by members of Congress or their staff that uh, can do the independent prosecutorial work when a complaint is filed and either clear it or pursue it. And until that happens, there will never be a clear uh, ethics process because there's not a, a clear ethics enforcement process. And today we testified that we also believe that the Office of uh, Public Integrity or Office of Government Ethics, rather, in the executive branch, uh, which does not have uh, enforcement authority, should have enforcement authority. And that's one of the reasons that we were asked to testify today. A and uh, that they ought to be staffed to do that and that this should not be delegated as it is now within each individual government agency setting its own ethics rules, essentially, and doing its own enforcement or not, which is mostly what happens. 
And I would just follow up a, a little bit of a yes and no. Um, yes, there are quite a few rules that were never enforced, and Jones made that very clear in, in why we think there should be some outside level of enforcement and enhanced enforcement. And there are some areas where we've suggested more rules in the areas of disclosure and restrictions of lobbyists. and, and whether it's complicated or not, Congress has to look at the gift and travel ban. You know, the Washington Post said 90 percent of the American public wants to eliminate all gifts. People are, these have become high profile issues, and while they're sticky to understand at the very bottom level of what's appropriate travel and what not, um, this has to be delved into. But I, I, I want to just enforce again this issue of who, who, is the fox guarding the hen house? Has there been a good job done? And when you lose the confidence of the public, um, you have to consider a different system to restore that confidence again. We, we have uh, talked to many executive directors and agencies in the states where they have independent ethics commissions. They have ways to deal with frivolous complaints. They have ways to make sure that the members have final authority, but that there is outside complaints and outside investigations. Um, it, it seems to me, again, in the end, that members do themselves a disservice not having a way to have these things enforced so that when something isn't a problem, people are immediately cleared, and when something is a problem, uh, that person doesn't continue to bring shame on the body. I, um, <clears throat> my staff and I have been quite concerned, and so we have looked at the ethics process, and we're drawing up some provisions, and uh, we'll discuss them once we get them drawn up, but one would be that any complaint that's filed must be heard within a given amount of time. And uh, so that all complaints are heard. Now, they might not need to be heard in a full committee, but I would think the chair and the ranking member ought to decide which are frivolous and which should go forward. And uh, that we need to put a time limit on it. I'm looking at starting at that point using the provisions that are already in law. And so uh, I'm in a quandary right now because I don't know, but I like this idea of an outside commission because uh, I represent Los Angeles. I'm on the West Coast. It takes five hours to get there by plane. So most often people don't have the details regarding the processes here in Congress. They look at the polls and say, well, you're no better than they are. We all get tainted and painted with a brush when we have members selling their homes and reaping the profit and living on yachts and going together to play golf and representing that private interest back here. We all get tainted because they don't feel any better about Congress than they do about other divisions of government. And so what is the best way to do it? And I think an independent outside commission needs to come there because it's going to be like this. As long as we have a two-party system, we're going to find, yes, I'll just finish my sentence. Okay. As long as we have a two-party system, there's going to be resistance to bringing your own up to ethics. So thank you for that recommendation. I would just like to clarify that um, because the Constitution requires the House to judge itself or the, each body to judge itself, the Ethics com Committee could not be would not be abolished, but rather you'd have the outside commission would process all of the, the, the complaints and whatever, do the investigation and recommend penalties. It would have to go back to the Ethics Committee in the end, but they wouldn't do that nitty-gritty everyday work. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, welcome our, our two panelists and thank them for their hard work uh, for the public trust and for good government, and we appreciate all that you, all that you do. Uh, clearly, taking trips to play golf is an outrageous uh, abuse of position and power and lobbying, and it should absolutely be stopped. But in my own life, I have worked as a lobbyist, as a volunteer for Common Cause, a former state issues chair for New York State, and, and uh, professionally for the New York City Board of Education. And I truly believed in what I was lobbying for and felt that I played an important role in educating uh, legislators who are really uh, spread too thin. You have to really uh, be an expert on so many things that you're voting on. And, and I think it's important that uh, you can explain uh, 
education, you can explain good government laws, that, that, and they need that help. Now, I would like to ask a specific question about educational travel. And I think my colleague, uh, Chris Shays, uh, started down this vein. There's an institute, it's a nonprofit, uh, bipartisan institute called the Aspen Institute. I have never been on one of their trips, but my colleagues tell me that they have learned a great deal. What they do is they'll go a certain site and they have a theme. It's either health care or education or the environment or energy, and they bring in a panel of experts in a nonpartisan way to explain uh, the depth of understanding. Uh, they've had them on, on uh, uh, many, many different areas. And my colleagues have told me that the trips have helped them understand complex issues. And every issue, you can look at it and say, this is right, that's wrong. You start looking at it, there's always uh, complexities. There's uh, nuances that you may vote a certain way and it has ramifications that you didn't realize um, on various uh, areas of our economy and of our constituency. And they think that these trips are very, very helpful for their understanding and coming up with good policy. I think that we need to have a good balance. We want to take out anything that is uh, not working for, for the good understanding. I think obviously some of the abuses that have come out are just you know sickening. I, I, I can't imagine why any member of Congress would even want to go on these trips. Uh, first of all, secondly, how, do, how in the world do they have enough time with all of the uh, pressures that we have on us? And so I wanted to ask a question specifically about the Aspen Institute. I, I would like to crack down on abuses of lobbying, but I do not want to crack down on the ability of Congress members to learn and understand and make better judgments. And I'd, I'd like both panelists to respond to that. Well, I think you've, you've again, brought up a, a very important consideration. And one of the value of, um, of both this committee having this hearing and what I imagine will be a variety of other conversations that will continue to go on is it gives us the opportunity to dig in a little deeper about how you regulate travel in the case of, you know, golf trips to Scotland that don't pass the straight face test and look bad in the eyes of the public, and how you make sure that this very important role of educating a member of Congress on the things that they would like to and need to know more about um, is still allowed to continue. And whether it becomes you know, strictly a public fund that that member has to spend, or if there is some middle ground, I think is a conversation that we're, we're happy to be a part of. Now, some people have proposed that in the case of the Aspen Institute, and I'm very familiar with the work that they do, um, that travel be allowed by organizations that are educational in purpose, or 501c3s by their IRS designation, which would include the Aspen Institute. But in fact, some of the money that Jack Abramoff funneled for travel was to 501c3 organizations, in theory, doing educational purposes. So the question becomes, um, how do we decide how to regulate this um, in a way that's appropriate and not overly restrictive, but that doesn't allow for these tremendous loopholes? And I, I want to add one other quick point. Um, and I've, I've mentioned this story before. I, I was formerly a state legislator myself and mm -hmm. had the opportunity to do a certain amount of travel on trips sponsored by 501c3 organizations. And on the one hand, they can have a great stated purpose, and many times they did. They had educational um, seminars, and they had uh, interesting places that we were visiting where there were things that we were learning. But I must say, at the same time, half of the people in the room were working as uh, commercial lobbyists. They were working for Verizon or Citibank or a variety of other interests. And we spent three days together not only learning a few things, but attending the symphony and perhaps going golfing or whatever was provided on the trip. And it gave a somewhat unreasonable amount of access to members of the legislature and perhaps got back to this question that we've asked before about were there future campaign contributions tied uh, to relationships? Were they able to lobby us in ways that the general public or other advocacy lobbyists mm -hmm. like Public Citizen or Common Cause aren't able to do? So there have been proposals that, that say that uh, maybe it's about how these are done by 501c3. Maybe you can have trips where lobbyists are arranging them or attending the trip. I, I think there's a lot of questions to be asked, and I don't think we have a definitive answer today, but we mm -hmm. appreciate the dialogue. Well, I would, I would just like to say that I believe there ought to be a public fund this is uh, something that's important for members of Congress to go to. They're going to add expertise from their own experience. They're going to learn from others. And I think that there is a public fund. There should be a public fund that pays for this. This is uh, something that, that members of Congress should have paid for. If you are an employee of the executive branch, 
as I was for many years, and you believe that there's an important trip that you have to take, you have a process that you clear it through, and then it's paid for by the public, and you, you uh, pay for, you uh, have to um, be compensated based on certain schedules for how much you can mm -hmm. pay for a hotel and how much you can pay for the airfare and so on. And I think that that's the way that it ought to work. Poor people don't have luxurious conferences at the Aspen Institute. As I've been at some of them. I think that they're wonderful. But you know, I don't think that there, if you start making that exception, then you're going to have you know, other uh, exceptions and you're going to have these front group 501c3s that have popped up all over the place by mm -hmm. business. And I just think that for fairness for the public, that this it ought to be a public fund. You decide what, how you want to spend that public fund as a member of Congress. You disclose it and you justify it. May, may I follow up with a question, Mr. Chairman? Okay. My time is up, but may I? Um, I, I? Quite frankly, I would support public funding of elections. And I supported it when we had a surplus. Uh, but uh, there is no way we are going to have public funding of elections with the economy that we have and, and the deficit that we have. And I don't think that there is any way we would be able to create a public fund for educational purposes. Now there is official travel, but there is usually an official purpose. Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, trade agreements in, in Australia, um, the Davos uh, Economic uh, Conference. Uh, there, there are official duties of members of Congress where I think if you don't go to the country, you don't really understand it. And you're and you're voting on huge matters. So I support travel. But there's a difference between official travel that you are there for a specific purpose and secondly, uh, uh, educational travel where you are, you are just going to learn more about an issue. And I, I personally do not think that in our budget situation they would ever create a special fund for, quote, travel. Um, I just read in the paper today that Coretta Scott King uh, received 60 honorary doctorates. And I, I'd like to follow up on the question of my, my colleague who has been a great leader for reform in this body, uh, Christopher Shays, who uh, worked tirelessly for years for campaign finance reform. And he was asking about educational institutions. Say, for example, if uh, some university wanted to give our chairman, Tom Davis, a honorary degree. <laughs> And uh, uh, and uh, they wanted to pay for him to come and get the honorary degree. That um, and he has a tough election, so he's not going to pay for it out of it. You can't pay for it out of your campaign. A lot. If you are doing official business or something related to your job, you cannot use campaign funds. There's a a very strict division. You cannot use campaign funds except for campaigns. Campaign, people contribute to have you reelected. You can't use it to go to an educational conference or to go to get an honorary degree because they did not give you that money for that purpose. That was for campaigns. And so there are some s situations, and I'm all for, 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 for knocking down on, on uh, influence of, of uh, abuse of power on elective bodies, but there are some situations where that legislator may be a better legislator because of having attended a conference that they understood the energy policies and the complexities or the education or the health care in a deeper form. And I'd like to throw that question back. Well, let me just. Uh, but General, let me yield for just a second. I also note the problem is if government pays for everything, you get what government wants you to see. You're never going to get a trip to the ANWR, given the current lineup, to go up and look at the negative side mm -hmm. if you don't get an environmental group to pay for it. You'll get a government coming up there showing you what they want to show you. If you want to go to, to Mexico or Central America and see the effects of free trade, it, it, the AFL-CIO ought to be entitled to take you down there and give you their perspective. You go out the government perspective, you get the government line. I, mean, I think there's some utility here, and I, I, I just throw that out. It's a, I don't know how we're going to deal with it. Uh, because clearly the trips got out of hand. But those are the kinds of issues I think that uh, Ms. Maloney is trying to get at. I, and Mr. Again, Chairman, I thank you. I, I thought you were going to make a joke about getting the honorary doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think Amherst is going to give me. I, but I, I earned I, it the first time, but I don't meet but the But I'd, I'd like to follow up test. on the Chairman's comments because uh, I am uh, in several disagreements with the current administration on ANWR, on uh, United Nations um, family planning, 
um, and other areas where we have votes literally on the floor on these issues. And um, in, in terms of the United Nations Population Fund, um, I attended a uh, conference in South America uh, that was paid by a not-for-profit on international family planning. And, 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 and other, in other words, that would have been cut off. You understand what I'm saying. Anwar would have been cut off. So when you're taking a position in opposition to the ruling government, there would be no way for you to learn the other side. Quite frankly, I was invited to several conferences in Canada on campaign finance reform. Uh, so uh, that was at one time in opposition well, to let's the administration. Get to, so you want to well, react to that? I would just like to say that uh, I'm not suggesting that the executive branch decide where you're supposed to go, nor do I suggest that the leaders in Congress decide where you, you should go. I think that the fund should be one that's allocated to the member of Congress to make that decision, and they, they can't do everything, so they're going to have to make certain decisions. And if your preference is to go to South America or up to Anwar or to the Mexican border, then that would be your decision. And that's the way I think the fund ought to be allocated. Plus, there already are some committee funds that are allocated to members of Congress to take trips. And so uh, that's the way I would see it. I think that having a public fund frees you from all of these other problems that you're experiencing now and really hurts the public trust. And um, while I understand the, the uh, need for education institutions and the, the organizations like the Aspen Institute perhaps to be able to have you. I still think that that's something that's a part of your job. And you're a public official. I think it ought to be paid for by the public purse. And I think it's the best investment that the taxpayer would ever make. And by the way, it's one be one bomber for public funding uh, for the uh, United States Congress every other year. And I think that's a pretty cheap price. And I would do it any day of the week rather than have the, we wouldn't have the deficit gotcha. we have now because members of Congress wouldn't be able to waste the money that they do. I'll just mm -hmm. add a couple of quick thoughts because, again, as I said, this is a this is an important part of the dialogue between understanding what's appropriate and you know what could be financed. And I, I, I appreciate the concerns that you've raised. And I, I again just want to reinforce um, that I do think that travel is important for members, and I think expanding your horizons is important. But the other sort of bigger picture question, which I think is the reason that you're all here today, and there's so much attention, is what is it going to take to restore public trust? In, in Congress. And I, again, don't think we're done here. I think this is going to go on because it's a campaign cycle and because there's going to be more indictments. And so the question becomes, I think of all of you, what will you be willing to do to restore that faith again? It's, it's not as if anybody wanted to be in this situation or somehow we think a gift ban will bring it all back together again, but it may in fact be worth the investment of taxpayer dollars uh, to spend on a travel fund or to have public financing. And I, I just want to say, I, I know we're we're all quick to discount how hard it is to use public money for these things, but the Connecticut legislature with a Republican governor and Democrats just passed public financing. The House in California just passed public financing, and um, these things are going to keep happening. So when the states and the public is ahead of the rest of the elected officials, I think sometimes you got to look behind and say, wait a minute, they might be more ready than we think, and we shouldn't okay. discount that. Well, well you. my Thank last you. comment, uh, Congressman Meehan and uh, Pelosi have really uh, developed a bill and they're introducing it today and I uh, would like very much to hear your comments and I'm sure the committee would on those mm -hmm. two pieces yeah. of legislation. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, apologize with uh, having come in late and, and, and also to run off to another commitment, but uh, I do want to first uh, thank you for your leadership on this issue as we uh, work to uh, promote uh, greater confidence and trust in, in Congress and the federal government in general and specifically with your legislation um, of uh, the Federal Pension Forfeiture Act. I, I know that our colleague, uh, Congressman Kirk, was here earlier, and uh, I've been working with Mark on, on legislation that is similar uh, in some ways uh, to your legislation, different in some ways, and specifically different about the, the specific crimes that would be included. And, and we certainly look forward to working with you uh, as uh, you move this legislation forward to uh, address the, the breadth of individuals who should be held accountable uh, for wrongful conduct, uh, members of Congress as well as um, uh, executive uh, uh, political appointees, uh, but also the crimes um, 
that uh, are relevant to their forfeiture or their pensions. On the broader issue, I uh, certainly appreciate both of, of our witnesses here, uh, your efforts and your um, organization's efforts uh, focusing on good government and your input uh, today. Appreciate the written testimony. And uh, you know, I, I think this is uh, an issue that is uh, integral to uh, everything we do in Washington. As I say, um, having the public's trust is critical to us being able to address serious issues facing our nation and, and people believing that the actions we took were truly in their best interest and not in the interest of a special interest. And, and so restoring trust cuts across all issues out there and, and the efforts of your organizations and the chairman's leadership uh, hopefully will have success and move uh, very favorably in the, in the right direction. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One second. Any other questions? If not, anything else you'd like to add? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, we to very much appreciate it. Right. We want to, at least this committee, keep you uh, a, a part of the dialogue as we move forward. If you have any additional thoughts you'd like to share with us, we'll be happy to make it part of the hearing. Thank right. you. Thank you. Hearing's adjourned.